Good afternoon. I'd like to welcome you all to the 16th Veterans and Community Oversight Engagement Board Federal Advisory Committee meeting. I'm Eugene W. Skinner, Jr., designated federal officer, and the alternate designated federal officer is Mr. Chi Hong Zito. In an attempt to ensure you have a positive meeting experience, this meeting is being executed using the WebEx event teleconferencing pro, uh, platform. If you experience any technological challenges during this call or have questions, there are federal advisory committee staff available to assist you by email. You may contact them at V-E-O-F-A-C-A -A at VA.gov. A public comment session will occur from 425 p.m. to 515 p.m. Eastern or 1.25 p.m. to 2.15 p.m. Pacific. Currently, there are nine individuals selected in the order of, regist order of event registration. In the interest of time management, speakers will be held to a five-minute time limit, and if time expires and your name was not selected or you did not register to provide public comment and would like to do so, you are asked to submit public comments via the email at V-E-O-F-A-C-A at va.gov for inclusion in the official meeting record. Before I turn the meeting over to the chair, Lieutenant General Hopper, I would like to cover a few rules of engagement. Mute your phone line and silence all cell phones. Mute your microphones on your desktop. The chair has requested to please turn on your camera if your system is equipped. Allow the DFO or VCOEB chair to yield the floor to you prior to speaking. The chair will ask for questions and or comments throughout the meeting. Please hold all questions until the presentations are complete. And please identify yourself prior to speaking. After speaking, be sure to mute your microphone and turn your camera off if required. A yay or nay voice vote will be used for all proposed recommendations. Minimize your background noise while speaking. And note this meeting is being recorded. A couple of admin notes before I hand it over to General Hopper is there will not be a VCOEB GLA information exchange on 5 April 2022. And just as a heads up, planning is currently underway for an in person VCOEB meeting on the 21st to the 22nd of June. There'll be more to follow as plans solidify. Now I would like to turn the meeting over to the VCOEB Chair, Lieutenant General, retired John D. Hopper. Sir, over to you. Thank you very much, Eugene, and welcome everyone to the 16th VCOEB. Uh, as we inch ever closer to having an in-person meeting in June, it's, uh, it's uh, long overdue. Uh, we've got a lot on our agenda today and lots of, uh, lots of things happening. I'm pleased to welcome uh, Mr. Bursler from the Vet Veterans Experience Office joining us today, as well as Mr. Keith Harris, a special executive. Uh, and I think this is Mr. Harris's, I believe this is his first full board meeting, at least the first where he'll be a full board participant uh, in this process. So uh, welcome Mr. Harris as well. Um, <clears throat> we're also pleased to have uh, Dr. Braverman and his staff uh, thanks so much for uh, your help in putting this particular meeting together and, and frankly, the work that you all do day in and day out to, uh, to help our veterans. Uh, as most of you know, there are going to be some changes uh, in the uh, GLA leadership and uh, I'm sure Dr. Braverman will cover those in, uh, in his remarks. Uh, so without any further ado, let me ask um, Mr. Bursler. Uh, if he has any opening comments. Sure, can we go ahead and start with the Pledge of Allegiance? Uh, we sure should. Thank you very much. Let's uh, all stand and we'll do the pledge. Very good. Please raise your right hand. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, DFO, I owe you one, at least one for that. Thanks yes, very much for the reminder. Um, okay, Mr. Bursler, 
Yes, sir. Not, not, not a ton for me. I'm really excited to have Dr. Harris uh, as, as a part of this meeting. And I'm even more excited, sir, to get everyone together in person here in just a few months, uh, as G Eugene mentioned. So I know that we're all very excited about that. Uh, the VA chief of staff, Tanya Bradshaw, uh, is also incredibly excited about that and is planning to join us on that endeavor should her schedule allow. Um, but just with everything going on uh, related to the, the new uh, updated version of the master plan coming out very soon, uh, just honored to be a part of this and excited to continue to work uh, with all of you. Back over, sir. Thanks very much, Mr. Bursler. We're glad to, glad to have you. Uh, next up, Mr. Harris, welcome to the BCOEB full board meeting. Uh, did he make it back to his room? She do you know if he made it? That's all. Right this second. I think I heard him. Hi, this this is Keith Harris. Uh, sorry, guys, I literally just stepped in the car and she handed me the phone. Uh, I'll be back on camera in 10 or 15 minutes. I'm senior executive homelessness agent for LA representing the secretary's office on veteran homelessness in Los Angeles. Okay. Okay, Keith. Um, yeah, Keith is actually scheduled to make uh, to be the next um, participant. So what we'll just scoot him uh, down the schedule and uh, ask Dr. Braverman for some flexibility if he can step up now and uh, we'll begin uh, GLA's portion. Sure, happy to do so. Uh, nothing if not flexible. Uh, and thank you very much for the opportunity to participate in the meeting. We look forward to hosting everybody in June, assuming that some new um, variant of COVID doesn't rear its ugly head again. Uh, but uh, I think we're we're on a good path. Let me let me just start with that a little bit to give context of what's going on in the health system uh, since we last met. Um, we were kind of in the beginnings of the Omicron surge. Um, that was a, a very serious event for us. Over 700 of our staff members uh, got infected um, with 95% of them being vaccinated, although none ended up getting seriously ill, but we did have some uh, downtime and, and had to go into some contingency and crisis staffing processes because at the same time, uh, in our various locations that included inpatient medical surgical care, inpatient psychiatry, uh, our CLCs, our domiciliary and our CTS program, uh, we peaked at about having 120 veterans on station that were COVID positive um, at one time and more over the course of the uh, surge. Um, the good news, uh, relatively good news, is that um, among all of the veterans that came through, we, we did unfortunately have eight deaths, uh, but all of them were unvaccinated, partially vaccinated, or immunocompromised. So we have very good data to support the efficacy from a healthcare standpoint of vaccinations. And we are start and have started yesterday um, offering a fourth uh, shot, a second booster shot for those over 50 who have been boosted more than four months ago um, to be able to continue with their vaccination status because it is a lifesaver. So uh, I wanna encourage everybody to uh, do that. One of the things that we did during COVID was, uh, or during that surge, was that we maintained um, our CTRS and domiciliary programs to stay open during that time, despite having uh, some COVID infections in those areas. We determined that the risk uh, to those veterans was lower uh, than staying out in the street, especially for um, the city and county of Los Angeles, where almost all of the shelters were closed and all of the programs were closed because of COVID. And I think that uh, bared fruit uh, because our CTRS program expanded from the 70s to over 100 uh, veterans. No one got seriously ill since that's an outdoor program. We established a sec separate floor for isolation of domiciliary residents with COVID. Uh, and we actually established, to our knowledge, the only uh, county-wide 
uh, psychiatry ward for COVID patients. So we were able to continue um, our operations during that time. We're in a much better place now with very few staff uh, absences. We still have four patients in our inpatient uh, service that have COVID, so it's not over, won't be over for some time, uh, but we're back to routine medical operations. Um, the uh, the next thing that I want to talk about, as uh, General Hopper mentioned, is some changes to our executive leadership team. Uh, two uh, in our primary health care system, Dr. Marcia Lysat uh, had her last day last week as our Associate Director for Patient Care Services, our nurse executive. Uh, she's moving on to a promotion in the private sector. Uh, to be the nurse executive for Ascension Health in Wisconsin. Uh, so a good opportunity for her. Our associate director for resources, Ms. Prachi Asher, um, has been promoted to the SES position of deputy medical center director in Pittsburgh and will be departing on the 15th of April. And uh, in both of those cases, uh, we have um, interim replacements uh, who will start and then their recruitment uh, is out on the street and that actually closes in USA Jobs uh, on Friday. So if there's anybody listening who wants to apply for those positions, you have one more day. Um, the third and uh, most impactful as regards to uh, this uh, meeting today, um, departure is uh, Mr. Uh, Mac McKenrick, Robert McKenrick, uh, who has been our deputy director and the um, executive director of the SERS and master plan program for the last couple of years. Uh, Mac is also getting a promotion uh, to become the medical center director, executive director of the VA New Mexico healthcare system in Albuquerque. His last day will be tomorrow, so this is uh, sort of a swan song for him. Uh, and we um, you know, wish him the best as he goes out to uh, New Mexico and tackles the challenges of uh, being a director of his own um, facility and healthcare system. I do, though, want to take a few minutes and just kind of go over some of the, um, you know, I guess I would say successes or progress uh, that has been made. While Max been in his program and while we've been working together over the last couple of years, I uh, can start with the opening of the CTRS program in April of 2020 when we started, you know, with uh, a few tents on a parking lot, which is now expanded to over 120 tiny shelters on the Great Lawn and has been a, a very good program as a low barrier to entry opportunity for veterans. Uh, to come off the street and start getting engaged in healthcare and housing. We opened up the uh, Bridge Home Shelter in conjunction with uh, the partnership from the city and county of LA uh, later that summer. And then construction began on buildings 205, 208, uh, and then uh, 207 um, by the end of 2020, beginning of 2021, uh, which will bring 180 units or so uh, to the West LA campus by the end of this year. Um, there was a selection for the principal developer team, uh, a revision of the master plan, the metro easement and beginning of construction for a metro station to be up and running by 2017. And then probably most importantly, uh, the secure funding for uh, the utility infrastructure and the parcel readiness uh, needs that we have in order to move forward with the uh, construction and renovation of a lot of these buildings. That was a gap uh, when we arrived is that there was no plan um, to achieve the readiness of these parcels in order to uh, turn them over to principal developers or other contractors uh, and the needs to expand uh, the utility infrastructure, both dry and wet, um, in order to meet the needs of a large community that will be on the, the north campus of uh, West LA. So all of that is in a good place, and I believe that our master plan overall is back on track for many of the promises that the VA has made. 
Um, a slide later, we'll talk a little bit about the status of the master plan, but I will go ahead and uh, mention that uh, the staffing of master plan 2022 is complete. Um, it has gone through VA staffing. Uh, we did make a few changes based on um, information that was uh, given to us through additional consultation with stakeholders via uh, Dr. Harris. Uh, and uh, it's waiting for the sec secretary's signature. We expect that to happen in the next few weeks as they're putting together plans for uh, the public rollout of that master plan. Um, and uh, so that's the end of that section. I have one additional section to talk about because that was a, a request to answer a few supplemental questions and responses um, prior to our formal presentation that was requested before. So I have those here. Um, we also have them written, so I'll kind of summarize them verbally, and we've sent a written copy to Eugene uh, for inclusion as a document for this meeting. The first question was, uh, can a veteran, including homeless veterans at CTRS and those being seen at the emergency room, receive transportation to other parts of the campus without a scheduled medical appointment? Um, so our you know, overall response basically says that um, VHA provides mileage for medical appointments in terms of reimbursement, uh, that we coordinate shuttle transportation um, for those appointments. Uh, when uh, people need um, available shutters, shuttles outside of those appointments, uh, we have community partners who run shuttles uh, that operate on the campus and serve veterans residing at CTRS Building 209 and other SERS programs. Brentwood School provides an on-site transportation Monday through Friday, three times a day, starting at 9 o'clock, with stops at the Eisenhower Gate uh, by CTRS, the golf course, uh, Welcome Center, and Building 402. Uh, the, um, the DAV, Disabled American Veterans, also provides a shuttle operated by Butterfly, um, that runs between the West LA Campus Federal Center and Sepulveda Ambulatory Care Center. Uh, Metro, as part of our Metro contract, um, operates a daily shuttle that continuously runs 24 hours a day, every day, uh, between the South Campus parking lots, lot seven by Wadsworth Chapel uh, and Building 500. So uh, folks from CTRS can access uh, that shuttle by walking, you know, probably uh, uh, less than a quarter of a mile to the parking lot seven over there. Uh, and we also have a shuttle for Calvet residents and folks often use that shuttle as well. The next question is, where does the decision that VA employees cannot hold someone for a psychiatric hold rest? Is that legislation? Is in hey, Dr. Braverman, sorry yes. to interrupt. I just was um, Josh Bamberger. Um, let me get on camera. Uh, I just want to uh, respond to the uh, transportation thing before we go on to the next thing. Is that okay, General Hopper? Yes, Josh, go ahead. And, and I must admit, I am really unaware of the geography, but I know that Mr. Zenner, who I think is on the call, is more familiar with these things. And this was something that was a great concern uh, for our services subcommittee. Jim, are you on the call and can perhaps, did that question get answered to your uh, to, uh, a, a sufficient to you, or do you have any follow up questions to clarify if these transportation meet the needs of the veterans that you have become uh, aware of at, on campus? No, no, uh, no follow up questions, but uh, I think there might be a gap there that uh, happy to discuss at a later time. Okay, great. Thank you. Sorry to interrupt, Dr. Burton. No, no problem. And that, that Brentwood shuttle is a newer shuttle that started uh, around Thanksgiving time. So that's a newer. Um, available opportunity for folks that were running the three times a day in that particular area. <clears throat> okay, um, then the next question is, where does the decision that VA employees cannot hold someone for a psychiatric cold rest legislation visit OSP, et cetera? So um, just to clarify that the VA employees may um, hold someone for psychiatric cold rest with proper training and certification by our local government agencies uh, here locally in West LA, that's uh, LA County. Um, police officers don't have that authority um, per the VA's Office of General Counsel. Um, and the 
you know, Vision 22 senior security officer as a team working on some other procedures there. We currently have uh, psychologists and psychiatrists on staff who are trained and authorized to place patients on psychiatric holds. And I'll speak more to our operational piece in the next question. Um, are there any local concerns at the medical center level around VAPD having hold authority or LPS designation? So um, generally we don't have any concerns, but there is a plan for increased access and, and some improvement with our process. Um, the LPS, for those who aren't familiar with that, refers to the Lantern and Petrus Short Act of 1967, which establishes the legal basis for detaining and treating psychiatric patients. Uh, and that's administered here in the county level uh, where, where we reside. Our inpatient facility is also designated as an NP LPS facility. Um, so that means that we can receive and treat patients uh, with uh, the various forms of involuntary detention. Uh, two major ones, um, a 5150, which is a short term 72 hour hold, a 5250, and these designate the numbers associated with the laws, which is a two week hold. And then after that, we get into conservatorship uh, through the courts. And that's based on whether somebody is a danger to self, others, or a grave disability is defined as being unable to provide for themselves. Psychologists and psychiatrists currently uh, have that uh, availability within our privileging services here once they uh, take the county coursework and pass the exam. Um, right now, when VAPD, the police, VA police department, is called to address a situation involving such an individual, they may contact one of our privileged uh, clinicians who are on call in order to place a hold. Um, if for some reason no one is available, they may also call the mental evaluation team with LAPD to assist. As we stand up our own veteran um, mental evaluation team, the VMET, um, as we've discussed in some of our other meetings, um, we have uh, approval uh, to do that now as we move forward, as well as uh, funding, um, then the, the social workers who will be part of that program will also receive the training, expect them to pass the exam uh, and be able to apply those 5150 holds in association with our police department with the VMET. Currently, we have um, a uh, uh, one police officer and uh, an acting police officer uh, kind of serving in that VMET capacity. Uh, we have a part time social worker uh, as a you know, temporary detail while we're recruiting for uh, two social workers to join that team on a permanent basis. So that will enhance our capability, but we're able to do those as needed now. So happy to answer any questions about those, uh, those three topics over. Thank you, Dr. Braverman. This is Josh Bamberger again. Um, I think what our concern was in the services subcommittee is if a veteran was, you know, at risk for coming to significant harm either to themselves or because of their severe mental illness, if the system that is in place presently is responsive enough to be able to keep them safe, or if there would be this gap between identifying someone in, you know, in a serious situation and then having to go through this um, derivative, you know, calling somebody to do so. It sounds like you are, you're recognizing that this is a gap and you're working towards resolving that with the with the VMET program. Are you content with where things are at this stage or do you feel like you still are working to find a gap that needs to be filled? Yeah, and I, I would say um, it's probably less of a gap as much as it's a timeliness issue. You know, mm -hmm. to, in order to increase the timeliness, then having somebody on site with the teams that go out, um, like having those social workers with uh, as part of the VMET, that'll that'll improve the timeliness. Um, but I I have not um, I, I have not come aware of any situations where um, we didn't have availability of clinicians that resulted in any kind of negative outcome because of a you know the short delay in order to contact somebody. So um, we we have folks that are being brought into uh, our emergency department on 5150s every day. And I, I haven't seen a big, um, big gap, but I will uh, acknowledge that there's always a little risk that we can mitigate by um, 
you know, putting this VMET program into place. And that's our goal to do that. Thank you, Jim. Any follow up questions to that? Uh, no, just besides, is there a hesitancy to uh, expand it to uh, social workers beyond the uh, the VMET uh, team? Because I know uh, probably there's a lot more availability to social workers than there are psychiatrists and psychologists. In I don't. I wouldn't call it a hesitancy. I'd say that we hadn't identified that as a need. Um, uh, prior to this, so it's not currently in the social work scope of care, but that's something that we're looking at as we prepare for the VMET and um, if we need to have other trained folks in order to expand the capability, we'll certainly take a look at that. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, sir, and thanks so much for answering these questions out of cycle. I really appreciate the attentiveness. To oh, you're welcome. And so that's all I have, and then I'll turn it over to Mac to uh, dive into the program you also asked us to uh, present. Over. Okay, thanks very much, Dr. Bregman. You're not by any chance ready to talk about who will be the interim replacement for Mac. Uh, sure. What I can, I can sure I can tell you what I know. Um, so for you know because Mac is a SES, um, we have to go through uh, CMO and OPM protocol. CMO is the um, uh, I guess the, you know, career SCS uh, management office uh, or something along those lines. Um, so I'm allowed to designate somebody for up to 30 days as an interim. So Alan Trin will serve in that capacity uh, for the first month or so of April. Um, while sometime we expect either tomorrow or the beginning of next week, um, a recruitment both for an interim as well as a permanent replacement will go out through CMO to find um, uh, somebody for a longer period of time. Okay. Hey, thank you very much. You're welcome. And, and General Hopper, one quick follow up to that question too. Hopefully I won't be talking so much today. Um, have you considered putting a um, homeless expertise component in the job announcement as you recruit for this position? And maybe that's already in there. I haven't certainly seen it. But wondering if that's on the radar and, and expectation of this position. That's, uh, that's part of the job description uh, is for that and also for the strategic planning. So I anticipate that that should be in there. Yes. Okay, very good. Let me just uh, double check, uh, Mac, if you can wait a second to see if Mr. Harris is uh, on. <clears throat> and I think uh, he has a lump in his throat right now. It's hard to clear. I'm sorry. I, I said I think he has a lump in his throat, and it's probably pretty hard to clear. So we might want to give him some time. Okay. Very good. Thanks. Okay, Mac. Over to you, Robert. This is Keith. I, I am on. House Select Committee investigating the January 6th insurrection is looking into whether former President Trump used so called burner phones during a seven hour gap in official. Oh, God, here goes some anti veteran stuff. Christine, you need to uh, uh, mute, you need to mute Ryan Tom from CNN. Sorry about that. And General Hopper, this is Keith Harris. I am on audio, I'm not on video yet. Okay. Uh, are are you ready to um, make some comments now, Keith, or sure. do you need a little more time? Yeah, no, I'm happy to, and I I really apologize for earlier. That was a terrible time to be in transit. So my apologies to you and to everybody on the call. Um, I he wanted to get the eight eighty seven fund. Uh, right, Keith, you're at the eight eighty seven fund, right? Just now. <clears throat> okay, please please uh, mute your phone, your uh, microphones. Uh, how do I do that, guys? I'll just wait till this gets shaken out. No, okay, I think we're muted there. Can General Hopper, can you still hear me? General Hopper? We can read you. We got you. Yes, I can hear you. Okay, thank you very much. Again, my my apologies, and I'm 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 pleased to be here. I'll, I'll keep my comments really brief. I think much of my content is being covered uh, would, would be covered between Dr. Braverman Mac and uh, Matt McGarren. The, the what I wanted to share with the group is I, I've, I've been on in my new position for a little over three months now. Um, 
really deeply appreciative to the VCOEB, the the many board members that I've met with on on both subcommittees. I've uh, I came with a substantial experience on the homeless services side, uh, much less so on the master plan, the campus development side. I've really appreciated the expertise of this board. Um, I've had meetings with with dozens of different groups and agencies. Just came out of a meeting with. Uh, key VSOs have been involved with with the work here on um, on all aspects of it for for many years, and their perspectives have been uh, really valuable. Uh, Dr. Braverman referenced that uh, I was able to take some of the feedback I've I've received and and work with uh, the team at at GLA to um, um, incorporate some of that into the final version of the master plan. I thought that was a very effective process and and. Um, I've been appreciative of that. I, I, I don't want to steal Matt McGarren's thunder, but I do. I, I want to just share on the services side of things. Uh, we have uh, technical assistance providers here on grounds this week. We've been reviewing a series of recommendations on how to um, improve homeless services uh, for veterans across the board. And it, it touches on nearly, I would say, every um, every aspect within the continuum from from outreach and identification of homeless veterans through the process of referring veterans to the programs here to moving veterans rapidly through those and into permanent housing. And we see all of that in support of the goals that the secretary recently announced with the, the probably the central one being the goal to house 1,500 veterans into permanent housing during this calendar year. So we're, we're, we're really excited about the services improvement work that is underway uh, right now, and we will we'll likely be able to share quite a bit more with you all about that in the in the coming months. I think in the interest of time and, and the fact that again, I'm probably some of this would have been shared by others on the GLA team. I will pause there, see if there are any questions, um, General Hopper or the, from the board for me specifically. Thank you, Dr. Harris. Questions for Dr. Harris. Okay, thanks very much, Dr. Harris again, and, and um, frankly, welcome aboard. Thank you. Uh, okay, uh, Mac, over to you. Yes, sir, can you hear me? Loud and clear. All right, sir. Uh, thanks for inviting us. Um, if we can go to the next slide, Eugene. I think you're driving the slides. This is the agenda, and these items are based on the questions we received. Um, so we. It's our intent to answer the questions and uh, have dialogue where appropriate, sir. Um, next slide. First question was the status of the master plan 2022 approval. Dr. Braverman touched on that. It's with the secretary um, for his review. As Dr. Harris mentioned that he was able to bring us some feedback and we were able to tweak a few things. Um, in the uh, master plan that remained concerns for some of the VSO entities that Dr. Harris had met with. So uh, it is at the secretary's level. We're going over uh, the forward to it, I think at this point and finalizing uh, any other edits, but we, we believe we have the final there for signature and uh, we'll be working on that over the next few weeks. Next slide. So the second question was uh, stated there, fiscal year 22 budget, does the budget fully support the master plan 2022? So the first thing we wanted to do is uh, bring everyone back to the vision of uh, GLA and the GLA healthcare system and that we're a, a, about a billion dollar operating budget that supports um, all these things you see listed on the slide here. I'll just pick a few out for folks who can't see the screen and are only on uh, audio today. Uh, we have a, about 55, 5,600 employees, and of course that goes up and down. Uh, we serve about 87,000 enrolled veterans in the greater Los Angeles healthcare system. Um, we're across these five counties of uh, the majority of LA County, Long Beach ducks into the southeastern corner of LA County. We have Ventura, um, we go up into Santa Barbara, uh, the Santa Maria area, area San Luis Obispo, 
and then across to Kern County, Bakersfield, and Lancaster. So the 11 sites of care, the one medical center, two ambulatory care centers, the HC box, uh, of course, the medical center sits on this 388 plus acres, and Sepulveda Ambulatory Care Center sits on the 144 plus acres. Um, that, that's a very large area, a lot of density here, over 200,000 veterans. Um, and we have six, 604 operating beds um, between the uh, VAMC here at West LA and the Sepulveda Ambulatory Care Center where we have a, a nursing facility. I, so it's a large academic affiliation. We put through a lot of uh, academic students, about 2,000 a year, and extensive research program. So when we talk about the budget, and a question asked about the budget. The first differentiation I would make is that the, the master plan and uh, our efforts here to build the 1,200 units of permanent supportive housing and all the other things that go into a veteran community, uh, many of which have not been flushed out, all those additional activities that go into the veteran community, um, that's that building of the master plan on the North Campus, the turnover projects for the parcels, all of those things, the upgrading of the utilities, uh, that's a different budget. Um, and we we have some slides here that we'll talk about and show some of those projects and budgets. But I just wanted to be sure that we weren't talking about the billion dollar healthcare uh, budget that is appropriated and dedicated for the healthcare system, just like every other healthcare system uh, in the nation. Now we know that SIRS and the SIRS mission for the homeless exists within that budget and their personnel and their efforts are appropriated funds. Um, and we can see what happens when CTRS becomes an initiative, the care treatment and rehabilitative service, the tiny shelters. And we work on moving that from uh, an initiative into a validated program that can then use appropriated funds. So a little bit of crossover there in the budget, but. Um, the SERS budget is adequate for the mission they're doing. Um, I would say that in uh, response to this, but we are changing around some of the ways that SERS does their mission and adding additional emphasis and some additional positions and adjusting the positions in some areas that allow us to ramp up their activities. Uh, Matt McGarren is on the call and can certainly talk to some of those efforts if we wanted to. But I just wanted to put this up first as an answer to question number two, the overall budget, and then we'll go into some other discussions about specifically the master plan and how we uh, do a budget for that area. Next slide. So this question asked about what are the shortfalls, uh, what are the impacts, and what is VA doing to mitigate that? So you can see here, um, the master plan 2022 activities are outside of the healthcare system budget here. Um, the, the, the mitigation of risks and shortfalls is really through our partnership. And we've talked about this previously, the IPT, the integrated project team, and that's mentioned down there at the bottom, the GLA integrated project team. And there's a bunch of offices uh, mentioned in that third bullet that we really partner, uh, the chief of staff has taken the leadership role in that as our executive sponsor um, from, you know, central office headquarters. So we just had an uh, interim project uh, report or review in IPR with her today. We have those monthly. We provide updates on our budgets. Some of the same material we'll go over here today. We went over with her in a little more detail. And we went into a lot of other aspects that are supporting aspects as well as other goals and efforts with the IPT members. Uh, Mr. Sims, uh, Brett Sims from the Office of Asset Enterprise Management, uh, Legal Counsel, Vizin, uh, VHA leadership, uh, a bunch of different entities are on the IPT. And we really tackle these challenges um, and we get to uh, budgeting costs and things that have to happen sequencing so that there are no surprises. And if there are issues that are coming up and we identify those, we have an integrated team to resolve those outside of the normal GLA budget process, like every other healthcare system has within the vision across the United States. 
So th this slide really talks to that, where we bring it all together. The Construction and Facilities Management Office for their engineers. We have several other people in our office area here integrated with us. This week, we have a few people from OAM visiting and a few other folks. So we have this IPT that underlies the integration of staff and efforts on these projects. Next slide. So well, let me back up a slide for just a second and talk about the, there's a hit on that last slide that a lot of folks don't know about. It's VA's strategic capital investment process, uh, the SKIP. Um, the SKIP program is the way VA really focuses across the nation to prepare for the secretary the funding requests and uh, by specific projects that are approved that they want to go to Congress and OMB, Office of Management and Budget, and say, this is what we're budgeting in the out years for, for these projects. The types of projects that are included in there are the majors, major construction, like our new bed tower, um, some minor constructions, which might be uh, rehabs to particular buildings, interior or exterior, or a smaller project, and then NRMs, uh, non-reoccurring maintenance projects and some of our upgrade activity on the north campus fall under the nrm efforts and we have to get into the skip process uh, some of them that are larger might fall into the minor project and we have to get into the skip process we have already worked with vision uh, and uh, our regional cfm partners uh, and through oam to identify some fast track uh, potential and a, a different uh, area that we can move some of these projects to because when we get into a building and the buildings called for or like the two parking lots 38 and 48 they were moved forward on the schedule by a year or more um, we had to get in there quickly and we weren't allowed to go through this two or three year skip planning process so there's an acknowledgement that the work we're doing is unique and that we'll need to move projects faster and we have the support of Vision on developing a contracting team. Um, and I say contracting in the sense of developing the project contracts in support of the engineering team we have. It doesn't do us a lot of good. And we've talked about this nine person engineering team that we've been given the resources for and we have them on board and they've been doing great work for the last eight or nine months. If they produce a lot of uh, prop packets and detailed uh, construction projects, whether they be uh, NRMs or uh, miners, and they move that forward to the contracting office and those contracting office uh, personnel cannot process it, we, we hit this bulge in the boa constrictor. So we, we have uh, the go ahead to develop a separate team in the contracting realm just for our projects to ensure that they move through timely they get to solicitation, uh, bidding, and award, and then we get under construction quickly to meet our timelines for the housing. So we, we are not experiencing any delays. So we're building that uh, team right now. Um, we're starting to realign and advertise for individuals to work on that team. So we haven't experienced any delays yet because of this process, but we're refining how we do this to make sure that the system can handle the capacity that we're going to need to put through it as we continue to increase the turnover. So the skip process is out there. I wanted to mention it. Um, it's how nationally they manage all these projects and the funding stream and the approvals. But we have a slightly different uh, parallel process in there that, that moves a little quicker for us. And we're working that out. And so far, no hiccups in there. OK, we'll go to the next slide. This is uh, John Hopper. If I could interrupt you for a second, if you could go back, back to that slide, <clears throat> uh, and you emphasize that the master plan, uh, in essence, this project itself, this mandate from the result of the lawsuit to redevelop this land into a soldier's home, is outside of uh, the VA, uh, VA GLA, uh, GLA's uh, normal health budgeting process. So the question is really going into to fiscal year 2022, did you have a budget and was it funded? 
and is it going to meet the requirements of master plan 2022? So did you have a budget? Is it funded? Yeah, I understand that there may be hiccups. I just want to understand the process. Did you have a budget? Is it funded? And then you evaluate whether it's going to work and whatever other stuff you need to do. Yes, sir. Can I go to the next slide and uh, it, it helps illustrate what, what you're asking? Simple question. Uh, right. The, the budget is on the next slide, sir. Next slide, Eugene. Okay, sir, let me talk to it. So we, right, so in 2021, um, we determined that the turnover activities were not what we had anticipated them being between ourselves and OAM. So OAM leaned in and started using some capital funds and we started assessing properties uh, immediately 205, seven and eight to determine uh, what activity needed to be done or remediation or mitigation had to be done. We also knew that there was some asbestos, asbestos mitigation that had to be done in some of the buildings. So we had that budget developed for that year. And as we brought that engineering team on um, during 2021, they started flushing out all the other projects in those areas, whether it was moving a steam line underground, moving a power line uh, around on that parcel. Those were things that went into that budget. So we worked through 21 with our first budget for the actual turnover activities and we started assessing, okay, we have nearly 30 parcels that have to be turned over. What parcels are next on the list to be turned over and what act we have to get the engineers out there to tell us what activities have to be done on each of those parcels for turnover. And we knew there was the upgrade of the utilities uh, we had the short and the long-term water projects, so we put those on there. So we went in and asked for that funding the first year and received all of the funding that we asked for. So no shortfall there. Going and we started developing and requesting via memo request up the chain, but it's not a normal chain through the skip process. We asked through the VISN and VHA and up to VA central offices, uh, CFM, OAM, we're partners on that. And we made a request for 22 and all of that has been funded. So our, our budgets for 21 and our budget for 22 have been fully funded and we have a rough budget working now for 23. Um, okay, the parking lots came forward. So in 22, we had to adjust our budget a little bit because we have a building 233 on one of the parking lots. It's a smaller blockhouse building, but it packages uh, our medical waste that's then sent off site uh, per contract to be disposed of appropriately. But that was something that we didn't know the parking lots were coming, therefore we didn't know that building had to be remediated. So the, the budgets change as budgets do as we get more refinement. But to answer your question, sir, yes, sir, we had a 21, we have a 22 and we have a rough draft of 23 that we continue to flesh out. Does that answer your question, sir? Yeah, it Partially it does. It, are there any other VA programs that look like um, this soldier's home? Not that I'm aware of, not the activity that we're doing to develop this. There are other medical centers and Dr. Braver can, Braverman can speak of the medical center he was at, at where they had a couple of EUL buildings. And of course we have two EUL buildings at um, Sepulveda, but they're very, very contained, very limited. They're, they didn't require an upgrade of the utilities uh, across a good portion of a large campus, nor did they require this uh, huge turnover activity of land use uh, to clear the land of all encumbered uh, utilities and other things, nor the remediation of uh, some hazardous material like asbestos. So I'm not aware of any other facility across the nation that has the scope nor the depth of what we're trying to do here in the master plan. So do you feel like the budgeting funding process has now caught up with the scope of the program? I believe it has, sir. And uh, surprisingly, um, all the money that we've asked for uh, has appeared uh, through the process, whether it came uh, from OAM as capital investment, whether it came from 
uh, VHA or higher or whether it came down through the vision, they have all asked for it. We've explained why we need it and how we arrived at the point of that need. And each each time we've asked, it's been approved, sir. I've not had any funding challenges. Okay, thank you. Yes, sir. Mr. McKendrick, if I could ask you a question as it is sort of related to this is Dr. Bamberger again. Um, it always strikes me that we're trying to do a lot with healthcare dollars um, and turn the healthcare dollars into gold somehow, uh, housing and so forth. As you leave this position, any suggestions as to how this could be better? Uh, as to what, you know, things from your perspective now that you've done this for a while and struggled with trying to turn healthcare dollars into housing and other things that have, you know, required all these complicated partnerships. Any suggestions? Um, in, in my experience, you're right. It's, it's a, out, it's outside of the normal healthcare process or system to do uh, a community. I, I can see where it's reasonable and it's a, a pretty simple process and I, I over exaggerate that, but it, it's a known and effective process and uh, OAM uh, can come online and tell us, you know, we have the enhanced use lease process. This is how we do it. They build the building or they rehab the building and we move and they have one or two buildings. Um, that's pretty cut and dry and that allows for best use of land and keeping veterans close to health care because you're doing it on VA healthcare facility land. And that, that's generally very easy. The, the challenge here is we're, we're not just building a few buildings or adding a couple hundred uh, units of permanent supportive housing. We're, we're building 1,200, the current scope, and of course the land has been assessed for more. So as we go forward three, five, seven, ten years, if the scope needs to change, it can certainly adjust on the, the scope of the land here that's initially scoped. But to build a whole community, there's so many other things that go to a community. You, you, we're integrating uh, the job training, the skills training, uh, all the other things that go with that. We're integrating environments for families. Um, we're integrating whole health and all those activities, a community area, the barbershop, the salon, uh, meeting places, uh, we're integrating, uh, you know, in any community, I think you need 10 Starbucks or something like that. So a coffee shop and we have veteran canteen services determining how they would like to assist in either providing cafeteria or coffee shop environments and, you know, one, if not multiple locations across the North campus uh, to really build a community. And that's where the principal developer or community development uh, concept like Cabrillo Villages comes in and I, I encourage those that have not gone to see Cabrillo Village to go see that and how the community comes together in that community environment and they they don't I think they have a CBOC in that area I've talked to Long Beach about the CBOC there but they don't uh, own that area as a healthcare system type activity or entity so we're we're borderline in that area of how what's best to manage this area and how to, to develop and maintain this community. Do we eventually have uh, the equivalent of a homeowners association or some kind of community entity that really represents the community as it moves forward 5, 10, 15, 20 years out? I don't know, but it, it is a bit of a challenge and I, I'm glad to be part of it here at GLA as we figure this out and we find out, okay, uh, they aren't gonna take buildings as is, there has to be a turnover and where does that funding come from? and those other things. And it, it's been a bit of a struggle in thinking outside the box, but every level of VA I've run into, uh, Vision, VHA, VACO, they've all been supportive in how to answer these questions, how to get to the right answer to drive us forward. So yes, a challenge, a lot of questions about what we're doing and the capacity to replicate this elsewhere. If we can get it going and prove that it works, um, we could do versions of this or an adapted version elsewhere where needed uh, across the country. I hope I answered your question, sir. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate it. And uh, yeah, thanks. So the housing delivery slide here, I have this slide up. Um, you can see the rate and uh, number of houses being delivered. And this, this is relative to our budget. You can see the quarters going forward. 
So we're leaning in and doing the turnover activities. We also have to upgrade the utilities to make sure we have adequate utilities, whether it be uh, the water, the sewer, the power, all of that for each of these. So scoping out those efforts, the immediate challenge we ran into um, probably nine months to a year ago was the water pressure on the North Campus. We had to go back and forth several times and get the tests redone. It's an under pressure test, which is a little difficult and having the full pressure for the fire marshal tests. So we have a short term project uh, that's in place to get the adequate water pressure for 205, 7 and 9 up. Um, that concludes this week. So then we'll have the fire marshal out again. We'll get it tested and we'll get uh, occupancy certificate as far as water pressure is concerned for fire suppression. We also have a long term uh, water pressure, uh, water use and pressure project for the North Campus. That'll be out for bid uh, here shortly and then um, construction starting uh, September of this year. So turnover into the end of this year into next fiscal year. So we, we are thinking through those. We are working through those parcel by parcel. What's very important for us is the timing of the ask for the parcel uh, to be turned over because that drives our workload effort. We can't do up to 30 parcels at once. We have to take them as they're needed and really do all the work and get the contracts in place and get all the other stuff done. So it's a timing effort, but just adding this list to help answer the question about the budget. And as you look through this, you can see the values there. Uh, the number of units coming online and the expected estimated start and the uh, construction completion estimated days are dates there by quarter. Next slide, we'll go into budget for 22. Uh, nope, sorry, went backwards on the slide on my deck. So this is 21 here. And what's important on this slide that wasn't shown on the other slide is the dollar amounts. So in each of these efforts, we've uh, done the assessments by engineers, the engineering team we have, and know the scope of the project that either has gone out for bid or is going out for bid. Um, through this effort and some of these like the long term project, even though we're working it this year, the actual pull for the funding will be next year. So the 20 million ultimate expenditure will fall in next year's budget. So you do some of the prep work one year and sometimes it takes money to do the prep work to get the packet together. And that's the contracting packet that goes out for bid or solicitation. But the actual award and the actual expenditure um, falls into the next year on the calendar. So you can see the 22.32 million um, here in the FY21 budget, and just some pictures there of some of the activity that we're trying to prep and work on. And then the next slide is the actual 22 EUL infrastructure projects. So again, you can see some of the projects that we're leaning into, lot 38 and 48, as well as uh, the building I talked about, the small uh, hazmat medical waste building, uh, block building, um, 206, uh, some of the activity there. Um, and some of the activities we have to do uh, support other things. Um, uh, an easy example of that is building 300, the current kitchen, we're building a new kitchen on the South Campus. That's been delayed just a few months. I think it's pushed back three months now. Um, I think the final is October, um, near the end of October is the estimate. And uh, that means we can't get out of the kitchen on the North Campus, which means we can't do the turnover activities, which means we can't get it to the principal developer so we have a little bit of flux in there, and I don't think uh, we're talking with OAM, and we have been talking for several months. Um, so we have the ability to do some things to move quicker. We don't make the timeline so tight that it gets us in a bind. They're pretty tight timelines, but there's a little bit of flex in there. So the delay on the South Campus is uh, SoCal Edison, the power company, bringing the power in to generate enough power for the rest of the campus on the South, as well as the new kitchen. So some upgrade activity there, and I'm not sure exactly what their delay is, 
it may be parts or it may be work schedule. Um, we have had parts uh, coming in late for the kitchen because of the overall slowness of supplying uh, across the nation and other areas due to COVID and other things. So showing this budget and activity here, FY22, just wanted to put that out. Any questions? Go on to the next question that was asked of us. General, this is Anthony. Can I ask a follow-up? Go ahead, Anthony. Uh, Mac, for the fiscal year 22 projects, I assume these are all fully funded. Is that, is that correct? They are. We, we've put in an initial request ahead of time based on our initial estimate so that as we went into the year, uh, Vision and VHA above us knew what our estimated, you know, our budget request was. So we didn't want to just stumble through the year as we develop things to come up with a project request amount. So we're in there for that amount. We, we uh, have been given money every time we come to a project and we say, okay, we've got the packet developed. It's either, you know, uh, a little under what we estimated or a little over what we estimated. This is the actual amount. Um, we've not received any pushback and we received all the money timely. Um, in the contracting realm, you have to have the money uh, on hand when the uh, packet is approved for solicitation and ready to go out for award. You can't solicit or award something that is not funded and funds are not on station. So the funding has come in each time ahead of the actual solicitation that we need because that's the law and the requirement uh, for us to operate. So we've had no trouble there getting it. And we've had to adjust, uh, not all of them, but a few of these uh, up or down, depending on the scope changes as we got further into it at, or up as we got into the scope changes and we determined there were other activities that needed to be done or some of the activities were a larger effort than we thought. This is Steve Braverman. I'll just jump in with uh, one other piece. So the, the money is mostly coming from the um, American Rescue Plan funds, which are two year funds. So the way this works is that there is a pot of money. Um, there is an allocation for us. Uh, it comes to us when we need it. If we are able to execute more than this $42 million worth of work in this fiscal year, because we can move something from FY23 into 22, that money will also be available where if there's a project that doesn't get used, it can be put off and funded in the next fiscal year. So we're, we're in good shape when it comes to this money. Over. Yeah, I just want to follow up and say this is amazing. I mean, this is a lot of money for infrastructure projects. And in particular, you know, I know at the last meeting, uh, Mac, I think we talked about the remaining light utility infrastructure. And if I'm reading the slide correctly, it, it basically says it's fully funded. Yeah, that's true, uh, Anthony. There, There's no project we've run against that uh, hasn't been funded. Um, I think that's just a reflection of the leadership's commitment at the Vision VHA uh, up to the secretary's office that uh, they're not restricting our ability to get any of the funds for these projects because they're committed to the project we're doing after. Right, and, and one one clarification, you know, as Matt was describing, kind of separating this budget out. Um, this this wasn't the case a couple of years ago. Now it is. Um, that's a separate process. However, the money for our planning team, our local GLA execution team, Max team, the contractors that he was referring to uh, in regards to you know, putting together contracts, the engineers, the nine additional engineers that we put together last year, those are still coming out of healthcare dollars. Uh, and those would have come out of our you know, one plus billion dollar budget. But uh, Mr. Fisher, the network director, agreed to a set aside of seven million dollars uh, for us to cover those costs as well. So um, we're we're trying to make this so that it's a um, you know, segregated funding sources and opportunities, uh, so that the you know the plus and minus changes, surpluses, challenges that we might have in the healthcare system. Uh, doesn't impact our ability to move forward with this program where it may have before. Over. 
the only follow-up is just a comment it's not really a question is you know this is obviously a lot of money going into the the north campus and i would just maybe recommend or ask that va consider possibly uh publishing a a, a press release about this i mean i think it's a big deal and for people to see that va is investing the necessary uh, money um is a great sign and so that's that's the only comment i have left Thanks. And as the master plan signing gets rolled out here over the next month, that's part of the goal is to identify some of these uh, progress points that we've made. Thank you. Just, just one follow up, and it's probably tough for you to talk to, but it, is it fair to assume that the principal developers planning and execution is synced up now with the, with the, the pace? From uh, VA, I, I can answer that uh, generally from where I sit, sir. And then uh, I would invite OAM if they wanted to add on to that. Um, they they are in sync as much as the uh, delivery schedule as they plan uh, for each of the parcels. The challenge becomes, and we saw that with uh, MacArthur Field, uh, that. They, they struggle to get the funding for that in different capacities or to make the funding timeline to bring that project forward or when it was initially planned. So it slid backwards. And what did come forward were the two parking lots I spoke of, parking lot 38 and 48. So we, we're in sync with them in that we, we have a collaboration meeting every two weeks. Um, we have a monthly product that we review that shows everyone that's on time, each of the parcels, uh, not, not significantly different from the slide I showed you previously that had the start estimated start date and the estimated completion date. And that's how we organize our efforts. So yes, we are in sync, um, but at any given time, they could have struggles with the funding on a, a particular project and it could move backwards. And therefore, uh, they would look to move another project forward to fill that gap or there could be a funding opportunity for a particular type or a particular project that would cause it to come forward all on its own and we would make room for that project. So we stay in sync every two weeks with our sync meetings and then that monthly product where we're reviewing start dates and uh, completion dates and things like that and turnover date requests. And we do uh, documents between each other as to agreements to meet a turnover date and we sign off on that. So there's agreements that underpin the lease arrangements that are ultimately done by the Office of Asset Enterprise Management. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, absent any other questions, I go to the next slide. So question four was the status of lease, lease revenue funds. How much is available, estimated annual contributions? Um, so in this area, the um, you can see the uh, information there of what the law, the West LA uh, VA Campus Improvement Act uh, allows that was building on uh, the Leasing Act of 2016, the West LA Leasing Act. So. Uh, it's important to look at what it is we can do with that and the current Lacey's Brentwood School, uh, Regents, California, U UCLA, Safety Park Corporation and Veterans Housing. So the, the question asked lease revenue and I'm going to make a distinction here uh, because I wanted to be able to talk to uh, overall funding and that's available to us of this type. Uh, of course, we talked about healthcare budget and appropriated funds and how we uh, have the healthcare system. But these funds, the lease revenues and the Improvement Act called out a, a different type of funds, which also called out any restitution uh, funds, which we know is forfeiture funds that came back to us. So the lease revenues, uh, 6.81 million, and then forfeiture, we have 4.48. So they're in separate accounts, but both of those accounts <coughs> in our funding system are walled off in that they can only be used uh, per the law for the activities that are associated with the law and they're controlled and managed uh, through uh, 
the strategic facility master planning office any requests to use the funding for projects through SERS or other offices uh, whether we're trying to do maintenance in an area or we're trying to do construction or support CTRS <clears throat> with some minor construction and uh, projects whether it's putting up lighting or we eventually uh, want to pave that dirt road out there and some other things paving for the tiny shelters um, all those funding requests go through there and they're validated and that they fit this requirement and they come out of these funds so you can see on the slide the estimated annual revenue we only had the one-time forfeiture fund uh, payout of 4.48 million um, and we have drawn down some of that um, and you'll see uh, you know there's some activities that we've really spent the money on for supporting ctrs and tiny shelters and i can talk about those in a second um, so our total expenditures uh, is 4.97 um, and we we've really uh, drawn on the forfeiture funds uh, but that's not to say that we haven't taken out of both funds um, they they're allowed to be kept as the law stated for uh, no year money so the money doesn't go away um, in both of those cases so they're they're both no year money um, so uh, i can just run through a quick list of in FY 2017, after 2016 uh, and the passing of the law, we started to, uh, the, the leases were redone to put in their lease revenue um, of a uh, sizable amount that uh, is now generated. So uh, a million uh, 73, almost 74,000 in 2017. Uh, about the same uh, million one hundred and seventy three thousand in twenty eighteen uh, a million point two two six in twenty nineteen and a twenty twenty was a million uh, two eighty six and the the main providers or the providers for the revenue in all of those years twenty seventeen through twenty nineteen were UCLA, Brentwood School, and Building 209, the existing EUL. Um, in 2020, we added the Safety Park Corporation that was uh, put under lease, so that added to the uh, lease revenues. 2021, it was a uh, million 327. What, what we have to understand is the uh, COVID really had an impact on safety park and the utilization and people going out and generating revenue and some other things so what we had anticipated as increasing at least revenue from that for all projections kind of fell flat and we only went to a million three two seven for 2021 and 2020 was also relatively flat um, so we've spent uh, money uh, for electrical uh, site and infrastructure improvements in CTRS, tiny shelter area, uh, comprehensive planning. Uh, we spent more money during uh, the later latter part of uh, 22 or 21 into 22, um, which we really dug into some of the restitution money. Um, the uh, Expenditures were about a uh, 1.5 million um, janitorial services, hygiene trailers. Um, we have another hygiene trailer due in on the sometime in June. Uh, we've placed two administrative trailers and a welcome center trailer uh, on the property near CTRS. Uh, the two administrative trailers are in, in, integrated into CTRS, and veterans uh, often hold meetings in those trailers. Uh, it's an area for privacy. Each trailer has four meeting rooms in it. A uh, few are being used as office, and one is uh, storage for individuals that show up overnight. Um, we had security stations placed on the four corners. Uh, they were previously out in the elements, so now they have a uh, four walls and a roof over them. Uh, we're going to do the paving, so some of that is obligated for paving here in the next few months. And other infrastructure improvements, we had to. We talked about the electrical that was expensive to drop a small substation there transformer to drop sufficient power to support what we have 127 units on there now 
and the capacity to grow if we need to, uh, depending on supply and demand. So that's the general information about lease revenues and expenditures. I'd be glad to answer any questions. Ms. Hamilton, I have a question about the drilling lease. I don't see that up there. Is there a drilling lease? I thought there was. Thank you. Correct. And we get 2.5% 2. 2. of the oil revenue. Um, and it, according to the arrangement with the company, that revenue goes directly to uh, DAV and it's for transportation purposes. And uh, Butterfly is one of the companies that they use to provide transportation primarily from West LA to other campuses. Um, that, is uh, you know how much money that is? Um, we, we just had a meeting with them and went over the revenue. Um, it, it changed significantly when COVID hit because the lack of driving, a lot of the oil companies slowed down the drilling. So it went down significantly and it's come back up a little bit, but uh, the sad part is uh, that we don't control which wells they pull the oil out of. So while they may have increased uh, oil production in other oil wells in this area, the oil production from this well did not get back to its previous uh, volume or output. Thank you. I have a question, um, General Hopper. Um, the governance of the right. revenue expenditure, it sounds like it has the same strategy as the way that the budget overall for the medical center is distributed. Is there any rules and regulations as to who should make, be making decisions as to how that, that money is spent? And is there some strategy that could happen so that people who are experiencing homelessness who are the ones who could potentially benefit from this lease revenue could also be part of the decision making process as to how the money is being distributed. I'm not sure about this first part of your comment about the strategy mirroring or following the healthcare strategy. Um, the money is kept in the accounts by our finance office. And as we come across the need to use these uh, Alan Trin in his position as the chief of strategic facility and master planning um, offers up the uh, use of the funds for a particular activity. Uh, it comes to me and I look at the use of the funds to validate whether it meets the requirement of the legal, uh, what we want to use it for. We've tried to use it for security and some other things and we've run it to legal and legal has come back and said that doesn't meet the requirement in the law. Um, it has to be done a different way. So we've we've talked about that. Um, it gets briefed to the ELT, the executive leadership team. Uh, we do monthly briefings. Uh, the strategic facility master planning does a monthly briefing and the SERS program does a monthly briefing. So each of these offices or program areas briefs the ELT monthly and we go over the budget slides. We go over the activities and the expenditures. Um, let me just throw in here. I had to get the numbers uh, from Andrew here. So it's between five and $20,000 uh, a month uh, over the last year. Uh, and that's through the uh, ag agreement with Bureau of Land Management that that 2% comes out. So it really depends on how much oil they're pumping out of there and what the revenues are. And we've done a reconciliation with uh, DAV and their services and they had paused their services for a period of time and frankly I think the pause was due to a uh, I'm going to say financial uh, adjustment error on their part they thought they had less funds and they couldn't continue services but we reconciled all the funding with them quickly I had they had turnover in their office and their finance person that was handling the finance and we reconciled the money and they do have enough to continue operations so we, we held them accountable within a matter of days to continue the service. So it stopped for about four or five days and it started back up again. I guess you know, I'm really naive to this space and I know that Anthony and, and Rob and others have been much more engaged. But again, just to restate the question, deciding how the money gets spent, are there any rules and regulations within the VA that says that it, it has to be within the administration of the of VA GLA or could it be an outside organization or community based? 
oversight committee, not ours, obviously, but another that is involved in determining how the money gets expended. Do you know if there's any rules and regulations on that? Yeah, so I can I can answer that. Um, yes, it comes through GLA. It goes into one of our financial accounts. That doesn't mean to say that we can have some internal process that includes you know input from other sources. Um, we we do that in other areas when it comes to um, prioritizing programs or plans, and that's something that can you know happen here. Uh, the same kind of processes that we put in place for land use requests, you know, that are you know short term land use requests. So we could we can figure out some way to get input from the community in regards to potential uses of that, uh, but that's administered through us. Over. Yeah, just uh, this, is John Hopper. Just a, an additional thought. I had the same question as Josh. I, <clears throat> I I know what the I think I know what the law says, but. I sort of view these funds as really belonging to veterans because they only come, for, they're generated um, from the deeded property. And so uh, I think uh, Josh's question is a good one. And, and Steve, I appreciate uh, your answer as well. The larger question I think becomes, is there a philosophy about how the lease revenue fund in the future uh, will be um, uh, maintained? How do you see it playing? in um, in the um, uh, governance as well as the the uh, upkeep and repair of uh, the soldiers home it, it, so, it's, i'm not asking for an answer now but sure well, actually, be... I, I, I will give a general philosophy and that general philosophy is that um, the money in accordance with the rules that are attached to it um, that were enhanced by the west la campus improvement act last year um, would be used to cover things that appropriated funds cannot cover. Um, so that's the and that's the benefit really here that that by putting it in these no year money funds, uh, the the law says they have to be tied to facility projects. They can't be uh, tied to um, any other kind of appropriation or or um, you know. I guess group of um, expenditures that would normally accrue to another appropriation. So that's why Mac, when Mac was describing security, security is not considered a, a facility appropriation uh, requirement. So we couldn't do it for facility. We couldn't do it for uh, medical services. You know, we have to use our own appropriation. But anything associated with facility um, appropriation, we could use it for. But our goal is to use it for things that. We wouldn't otherwise be able to fund through appropriated uh, funds, uh, so that's why it can support housing. It can support the um, renovation of sidewalks and streets um, on the north campus grounds. It can um, build a uh, therapeutic um, outdoor area uh, where homeless veterans or domiciled veterans might need to be used. Um, it's the money that's being used to support the overall construction facility requirements for CTRS. So those are the things that we would want to prioritize moving forward. Over. While the funds are waiting to be used, are they kept in an interest bearing account of some sort? <laughs> no, no, it's it's a it's a regular government account. <laughs> so unfortunately, uh, it's um, a serious question. I I. And, and I don't mean to laugh at you, but I'm saying, but yeah. no, it goes into our, it goes into our financial account. So we don't, we don't get to do that. Yeah. So do you have any qualms about taking the fund to zero? Um, I, I think all like, that there's there in a particular given year. Well, well, we don't want to take it to zero because it's also being used currently for operational expenses, for example, for CTRS um, that we can't fund. Uh, you know, through regular appropriated funds. So, uh, and we'll continue to get some money periodically through the leases um, that generate uh, in income. So, our our goal is to make sure at least that there's money that will sustain funds for those kinds of programs like CTRS. And if there are other programs that come up in the future that require facility infrastructure costs that aren't available through appropriated funds. Um, and then, but besides that, no, our goal would be to spend the money uh, and, and get it get it to zero in 
as long as our annual requirements are met. So there need to be some surplus reserve uh, to meet those annual requirements if they exceeded the lease revenue. Over. General, Good. next oh. next slide. I, I Sir, think we're talking about some have, of these things. Somebody had a question, I think. General, it's Anthony. I think it just has a quick two yeah. question follow up on the on the previous slide for the um, funds, the lease revenue funds. I assume that's um, total total collected since the lease revenue fund was created. That the total that that would be the total from creation of the fund. That's correct. And then there's an additional fund from the restitution, which is 4.48 or something like that. With regard to the total expenditures, is that uh, blended from the two accounts or is that just from the lease revenue fund? It, it's from both. And do we know as far as the percentage of expenditures, how much went to, for example, CTRS versus um, minor construction type projects? We, we have every expenditure itemized and we can certainly pull that and share that. Um, and we, we want to make sure that the tracking on this funds, the funds in and out is crystal clear um, for, for all purposes of audits. So we, we do have that. Okay. Well, I, I mentioned it because in, in the past, the federal advisory committee adopted, I believe two recommendations regarding use of the lease revenue fund to support emergency shelter on campus. So, you know, I, I think that's that's a great thing. The one follow up I had specifically on the governance item number 3. Um, recently, re we received feedback um, from our, I think, 13th BCOEB recommendations regarding seismic funding. Um, in general, I, you know, just to summarize, it was that major construction dollars could not be used for anything outside of mission critical facilities. But at the very end of the recommendation, it discussed that VA would possibly consider seismic fun, uh, uh, minor construction dollars for extraordinary seismic projects. So to that end, could GLA theater theoretically make a capital contribution to an enhanced use lease or are capital contributions only um, allowed by OAEM. In other words, could lease revenue money be used for seismic corrections? I don't I don't know the answer to that. I would have to go through OAEM and through legal to make sure that the expenditure is appropriate. And I, I go to legal on just about every expenditure unless it's a recurring one to make sure it falls within their guidance. Um, so I, I can't answer that off the cuff, uh, Anthony, but I'm glad to follow up on that. Yeah, I was just curious because um, you know, the Improvement Act did include minor construction, minor construction projects at the campus as, as an acceptable um, expenditure. So I was just trying to think if there was a bridge between GLA's lease revenue fund and potential seismic funding uh, necessary. But um, yeah, there's obviously right. no answer today. Sure, and I, I think it gets a little sticky when you're reinvesting in a building that you're then turning over to an EUL to do the seismic, and they're going to come in and do holistic construction, which interferes, uh, I assume, likely interferes with the seismic uh, retrofit that was just done. So I think it goes to all that. It's a complex answer. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Next slide. So this is. Uh, for all practical purposes, the last slide but does answer the question, General Hopper, of you know the annual lease revenue generated from West LA leases is a million three. But what it doesn't have on this slide, uh, because remember in the, here we're tracking the funds, uh, lease revenue funds, and contributions that are available to us directly to use for these many projects under the uh, enhanced law, but the oil well lease revenue of 2.5% goes directly to DAV. And while we monitor that and we get a service for that, and we monitor the service and we hold them accountable for the expenditure and the overall amount, um, we do not have access to those funds for anything but that service uh, per the lease and the agreement 
that was made by that. So this is what feeds into. So if we were to take it to a zero dollar at any given uh, year, we would have those recurring uh, maintenance like janitorial service and other things that we would struggle with. But each year over the year, uh, it, and it comes in monthly, it, it, you can see the revenue building up again for that year. Mr. McKendrick, has anyone ever done an analysis at the dollar value per square foot to see if we're talking apples and apples across these different participants? And could maybe we get that at some point? Square foot. I'd have to check on that, sir. I, I don't know the answer to that. Yeah, I, I'm sure you don't. But just just looking at this one slide and thinking, you know, how big is the the Jackie Robinson Stadium, and how much does the university pay for a foot of land that's supposed to be for housing for veterans? And how much does the Brentwood School pay for a foot of land for for uh, housing uh, land supposed to be for housing for veterans? And you know, is the VA getting a good value on renting out that space? We'd be curious to have that comparison. Sure, we can look into that. Be glad you. to get you an answer. Okay. Next slide. Subject to any questions? That was the. Uh, Answers to the uh, questions that were presented to us, sir. Are all of our leaseholders uh, cur current on their payments? They are. I had a quick question, General Hopper. Um, going back to the beginning of the presentation, Mac, um, you had mentioned some of the changes uh, within SERS that are being made to support some of this work. Um, I don't know if it's now or later, but would love to hear a little bit more about what those are. Sure, I think we're over our time hack according to the agenda. Um, I know Matt McGarren is on, but we can certainly take that as a question and have Matt provide an answer, and then we could uh, give that out at a later point. I'll leave that to General Hopper. Uh, yeah, I think we're into our, our uh, public comment session. Uh, so let us, uh, we'll circle back on that, Heidi. I think we'll have enough time. Okay, Eugene, over to you. Um, let's do public comments. Okay, stand by, sir. Okay, sir, the 1st individual we have today for public comment, as you recall, is, is it was based upon the. The time uh, when the uh, public registered, so the 1st, 1 we have will be. Miss Janet Turner. Miss Turner, are you there? Yes, good afternoon. I, uh, the 5 minutes starts now, ma'am. I'm happy to give my time to the next person. Thanks so much. All right. So, and the next we have Mr. Rob Reynolds, stand by, sir. Uh, I know you weren't here. Mr. Reynolds, are you on, sir? Yes, sir. <clears throat> so your five minutes starts now. All right, perfect. Um, <clears throat> one of the first things that I'm concerned about is, you know, the, the oil revenue only gives 2.5%. That seems incredibly low. And then also that this money is supposed to be going to DAV to provide transportation doesn't make any sense. Why are we relying on Brentwood School to drive a van around to bring veterans to appointments? Why is DAV not providing transportation to the veterans on the campus? That's one of the uh, biggest challenges we have is getting veterans transportation to their appointments. I know a lot of peer supports end up driving them around. Uh, so if there's money that's available to actually be used for that, we should definitely be doing that. Um, furthermore, the, uh, the UCLA baseball stadium, I mean, <clears throat> You see in the recent report, they're paying a half a million dollars less than they should be. 
this this whole situation on the property is just um, it's really it's really disgusting what's going on. Um, it's no secret that the VA has definitely prioritized listening to uh, special interest groups like Brentwood School, UCLA, at the expense of veterans and have done it for years. Um, and this master plan that talks about pushing housing construction out over the next eight to 10 years and prioritizing things like a town center makes no sense. You got the Purple Line Metro train. I see that all the time. Construction full speed ahead. You got crews there seven days a week. I go up and I look at building 207, 205, 208, skeleton crews, barely anyone there, just taking forever. I mean, you can see where the will is, and it doesn't look like the will is to get the housing done. It looks like the will is to work with the Purple Line Metro, work with UCLA, work with Brentwood School, while the veterans stay in tiny shelters. Um, <clears throat> and furthermore, you know, the, uh, the whole way the situation went down with um, UCLA's second lease amendment and that practice field. I mean, that was um, that was really ridiculous. That should not have happened. That should not have been orchestrated in private. Uh, everyone should have known about that. Um, it's not right what's going on in this property. And I think everyone needs to t take a step back and realize that the focus needs to be getting the housing built. And the focus should also be getting these leases off the property. Doesn't make any sense. They've been, the OIG says that they're illegal. So what's going on here? And it's uh, tired of hearing um, executives defending Brentwood School, because basically what they're defending is someone that's breaking the law. If the Office of the Inspector General says the lease is non-compliant with law, non-compliant with the West Los Angeles Leasing Act, what are we doing here? Why are you defending it? Um, it doesn't make any sense. And furthermore, Congressman Ted Lieu's office in 2016, when he passed the West Los Angeles Leasing Act, in his own words, he said that, that that legislation was to ensure that all leases on the property principally benefit veterans and their families. However, that legislation included a 10 year lease for UCLA baseball stadium. It just shows what's going on. There is an effort behind the scenes to always protect UCLA, Brentwood School, the oil, Purple Line Metro's interest on the property at the expense of veterans. And a lot of meetings are held in secret. The VCOIB is getting better with getting input from people, but for years, you guys weren't getting good input. And I believe that the homeless veterans need to be addressed and they need to be brought into their concerns of what they have going on. There's just, there's just a lot of improvement needs to go on. I don't think that anyone should sign the master plan right now. That should be um, nothing that we're even talking about. The goal should be to get everyone together and get everyone on the same page because that's clearly not the case today. And it needs to be moving forward because this is this is unacceptable. Los Angeles is the nation's capital to veteran homelessness, and there's enough land, enough buildings to get all of them housed. And we need the will there to get the housing built, stop listening to all these groups like UCLA, Brentwood School, who have no business being on that property to begin with, and let's get the veterans taken care of. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Reynolds. Uh, I didn't see a Mr. Ferris Khatib. Are you on the line today, sir? I haven't seen you as of yet. Uh, Corey Robichaud. Raymond Hall. Mr. Laughlin, are you there, sir? Yes, I am. Yes, sir. Your five me? minutes starts now, sir. Yes, sir. We can hear you. Uh, I'd like to. I'm getting feedback. What's wrong? Sir, I believe you have a telephone on as well. You have two different sources with your no, name. No, I don't have a. I don't have a telephone. Okay, but well, we can hear you clear, sir. Well, it's very difficult for me to talk with this feedback. But first of all, I want to thank Joshua Bamberger for his insightful questioning. Very good. And secondly, I don't understand, except for the revenue being produced, why in the hell 
the Brentwood School and UCLA are on land that was dedicated, deeded to veterans. It's against the law, as Mr. Rob Reynolds just mentioned. The way you have treated the veterans that had been on veterans row since you brought them in is really uh, inhuman. You, you have isolated them from their supporters. You don't feed them. The only food I have ever seen any of these veterans eating are cold sandwiches. I have asked Matt McGarren to provide them a day room. He tells me to go and fill out a three-page application along with a one hundred thousand dollar liability insurance policy that i would have to provide i told him that was his job to provide a, a, a day room also i've added to the day room list an exercise room or area plus the uh, utility the uh, equipment that has to go with exercise. And finally, I've asked him to provide the veterans with an educational resource area. And I don't know why he has asked me as a veteran with no official connection to the Department of Veteran Affairs to pro to come up with all this three-page application in a hundred thousand or maybe it was a million dollar insurance policy. It's ridiculous. I told him that was his job. The problem is this isolation with uh, the supporters unable to access the veterans, the homeless veterans. We don't know what's going on. Now, through sources, I've been told that these two 20 foot by 20 foot modulars are being used, or well, one of them at least, as a day room. So why he doesn't let the supporters know this is beyond me. It's like a game that the VA is playing with their supporters of the homeless veterans. In these eight by eight foot boxes, they might have a door, but no key is provided to the residents. And I was there after that heavy rain, and it's it's impossible for those residents to navigate to the distant uh, mobile showers and these nasty porta potties with all these empty buildings standing empty on the northern land. I don't know why in God's name the VA put them in these eight by eight so-called CTRS encampment. Mr. Laughlin, you your time is up, sir. Mr. Laughlin? Yes, sir. Your time is up, sir. I heard that. Yes, sir. Thank you very much for your comments, sir. Next one on the list is uh, Mr. Gary Blasi. Are you there, sir? Oh, 
not see him. So the next one will go to uh, Mr. Mr. Francisco Juarez. Are you there, sir? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you fine. Your five minutes starts now, sir. My name is Francisco Juarez. I'm a PMI uh, certified project manager in 1988. You cannot deny that many veterans have complained about the upheaval of the of the topography on this land. The Metro Purple Line uh, has violated its own agreement clause. It has negatively affected the environment of this national home for disabled veterans. For the record, your maps do not uh, take the land of Brentwood School into account for development of housing of veterans. CNN recently ran a story that described the tip of the iceberg of collusion and corruption that voting members may perpetuate today with the wrong advice to Secretary McDonald. And below the waterline, America's moral obligation to genuinely care for her defenders is at stake because this, quote, home versus uh, healthcare expansion, end quote, mix, again, the goal of which was not properly brainstormed, therefore not properly project managed. While these presentations and loaded questions all sound so formal and professionally planned, how is it that the hand-picked VSO cronies like the Allermans, Valdezes, Hernandez, and Van Curen, the regularly so-called bed reps that you have counted on for support of this land fraud, have access to a closed meeting in the 1887 fund building prior to this meeting? How does Keith Harris, uh, who was late to this meeting because he was there, first meeting, and expected plan endorsement as a senior homeless person come at such a crucial time. Mr. Harris, you have not engaged in HGVS coalition, AGIF, LULAC, or what I know of uh, VVA. AGIF, VVA, LULAC, and possibly AMVETS will not support this plan because there are too many unanswered questions. There's been too much loss of life, too many mental breakdowns, and too much loss of land to the long-term EULs. DCOEB supposedly solicits input from a full range of stakeholders on how to best use the greater Los Angeles homeland, not campus. For the record, your range is not complete. As an advocate that has followed the whittling of the land for decades, this so-called master plan will result in less land to be enjoyed by veteran residents because the non-veteran special interests that take control of the North Campus uh, do not belong on this land. This is a land racket funded, influenced, lobbied, and orchestrated by insider speculators, including developers like Thomas Saffron, uh, UCLA, Brentwood School, Maverick Energy, for-profit and non-profit U.S. vets, and the so-called VSO representatives I mentioned. Department of Veterans Affairs bureaucrats, including those presidents, have for years squashed the sense of urgency that we feel is required to save lives and make best use of this land to impact veteran homelessness and do away with exclusive land, uh, uh, land use policy that favors non-veteran special interests over the unhoused veteran. This has been a pay to play operation. Number one, VCOEB is not solicited or engaged the stakeholders of the most vocal factual challenge uh, group challenging this plan, the NHDVS coalition many of whom live in the uh, outdoor encampment of this homeland. Among its many accomplishments, NHDVS research is responsible for the, quote, emergency powers, end quote, that the secretary found to bring veteran row inside, and NHDVS research is responsible for CNN's objective report. The, homeless, uh, the homeland consists of the inland footprint and it consists of beachfront property that was separately deeded on the same day as the first specific and permanent deed was. I have the title research in my position uh, for the beachfront property that demonstrates it as a part of the vision that you will do away with if you vote wrong to maliciously repurpose this land that is flawed with this flawed plan that your vote can stop would be to render the beachfront property given in, in perpetuity for the quote residents end quote and of the home quote unquote as surplus land like land grab like land grabbers want the public to think of that portions of this land uh, are and this land racket will then continue to be challenged beth an nhdbs coalition veteran family member wrote so according to our mayor, the veterans homelessness should have ended in 2015. 
What would even make him think such a thing, much less say it? That's what, uh, what's that? He lied and Brentwood School is actually squatting on veteran owned land and what UCLA research has and is using the land illegally. Well, the real owners of the land, please stand up and begin the eviction process. And Ryan, the subject matter expert of land use at PA West LA wrote, despite my continued astonishment over your refusal to extend the federal register public comment period regarding the West LA VA soldiers home purported master plan and community plan, or at least such opportunity for true and critical public comments there about, I remain faithful. We can agree that may we can agree there may be no good reason to suppress public notice or public comments regarding federal document 2022-02796 RIN 2900-AQ23. Yes, there is. He has yes, been excluded from providing input. In summary, homeless expert is part of the job description now. 2015 was a goal to end homelessness. Max report is all about the medical center's work in the region. Your vote will repurpose the, the land use mandate for house. Mr. Juarez, your time's Thank you up. very much. Thank you. Next public comment is from Ms. Pharrell McCarney. Ma'am, are you on the line? I'm going to unmute one call in user to see who this is. I don't have a name. Call in user, can you identify yourself, please? Yeah, this is Ryan Thompson. Okay, Ryan Thompson. All right. Okay. I don't have you on the registered public comment, Ryan. So that's, be, that's because you blocked me. That's because you blocked my IP address and you wouldn't let me sign up because you. Sir, that ends the uh, public comment session. Hello? Okay, Eugene, thanks very much. Thanks to all the members of the public that, that signed up. We, we do appreciate your comments and we will certainly take them. Take them under consideration. Is it possible to hear what Mr. Ryan Thompson has to say? Uh, no, ma'am, Mr. Thompson did not sign up. Well, he can have my. Who, who is that? It's uh, Miss Wool, sir. I've muted her. Okay, thank you. She wasn't signed up either. Uh, next on our uh, next on our list today is uh, by name list presentations uh, by uh, Community Solutions. We'll see if they're on, sir. Okay. Uh, I don't see. I don't see them. Hang on a second. Miss Mesa, are you there? Well, a little early, sir. So okay. if I, it may, uh, I think Heidi had a had Heidi had a question uh, yes, or comment. Heidi, could you restate that and uh, and then we can pick that up, perhaps. Sure. Um, my question was uh, when Mac was presenting, he mentioned at the beginning some of the shifts that are happening um, within SERS to better support the overall strategy on master plan implementation. Um, and the work being done on the campus. So just wanted to hear more um, from Matt or whoever about what that, um, what those changes are and what that looks like. Okay, great. Matt, can you pick that up? I can't hear you, Matt. But you're I think you're on mute. Let me double check. Here. Sorry, I had the wrong microphone set. You can hear me now? Yeah, here you find me. Okay. I lost my train of thought. Okay. Thanks for the question, Heidi. Uh, so we've been uh we're doing also um not just about the master plan, but also my job is for the ending veterans homelessness all through the greater Los Angeles area. So we do have a number of strategies that we're working on to address that issue. And uh, a lot of Heidi's team has been involved in these uh, meetings that we have, these uh, strategic meetings with our technical consultants that have been meeting with us 
along with our Dr. Harris and his uh, homeless program office uh, management team. Uh, they were all out this week. Uh, we were in a number of different meetings and we do have some uh, working on some strategies that are both system system wide strategies to um, better coordinate our by name list. I see there's a by name list presentation coming up, but our by name list and our coordinated entry uh, system uh, and also to uh, identify the veterans that are homeless to have a veterans um, coordinator and, uh, and someone who can do our data performance, our data lead so that we, our data does all match up with data that LASA has and our other uh, housing authorities have. Uh, we're also working with uh, the teams to, uh, we're looking at a housing locator contract right now that we just signed the funding for today. Uh, so we're hoping to get a new housing locator contract to help with our uh, finding available units in the community. Uh, I understand that LASA also has a contract now that if uh, we want to compare and contrast and see what the uh, the most effective way to use that contract. Uh, we have a number of project based units in our community that are not filled yet, and we're working with those property managers to get those filled as quickly as possible. These are all in connection with our uh, secretary's goal for us to house 1500 veterans by the end of permanently house 1500 veterans by the end of this calendar year um, and use up. Uh, utilize 75% of the vouchers that we have available now and to speed up the process of getting veterans housed. So within 90 days for at least half of the veterans that are uh, be, that are receive a voucher this year. Uh, that's a scratching the surface. Really, we have a number of things in the work where uh, these, this is a work in progress um, and we're taking the one uh, step at a time to get these uh, things accomplished. Uh, do you have uh, more specific questions that you'd like to answer about any of those strategies? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm aware of the goals. I think that's great. I just wasn't sure if there were other like concrete shifts you were making within the VA scope to make those things happen. But um, yeah, we'll have more concrete goals. We're putting together the recommendations from the technical assistance team this week. Cool. So we'll have more concrete strategies um, developed next week. Hey, Matt, this is Josh. This sounds great stuff. Thank you so much for making headway. We'd love to have as much of that information with the VCO or VSUB, uh, services subcommittee as we can. So as you okay. make those contracts, uh, the specifics as to how much money is being spent, uh, how many units you hope to be able to get from the housing locator agencies, uh, all those other kinds of things would be really helpful for us to get some de details on um, sure. uh, so that we can be uh, uh, as aware as possible to see this wonderful so, progress, so that'd be awesome. We'll keep you uh, informed. Uh, any specific questions, just let us know and I'll answer them and uh, we'll keep you updated. And perhaps, uh, I don't know if you can be able to stick around and hopefully the people from Community Solutions will be able to, to join when the time yeah. gets Sir, to Sir, Adam Rouge is on. Okay, but um, you know, specifically commenting on what uh, they have to say about the fidelity of a by name list and how that plays into what you're trying to play out and. I imagine that the consultants are basically saying the same kinds of things. So, Community Solutions is on, sir. Standing by. Would you like me to do an introduction to uh, General Hopper? Or sure, Josh. Yeah, I didn't prepare anything, so I'm just going to shoot from the hip. But um, I'm re really excited to have our colleagues from uh, Community Solutions here today. As you uh, may be aware, they're a national organization that has really been leading the charge across the country to uh, achieve functional zero in many communities. And we'll hear from them as to how many communities have achieved functional zero for, for homeless veterans. Um, with you know, many uh, communities have achieved this, uh, Los Angeles not being one of them for a lot of reasons that we'll hear about, um, but they have been great success and using the same strategies, the same playbook across all these different communities, which include uh, high fidelity by name list, um, organizing everyone into a similar kind of goal and as you all may be aware, uh, the MacArthur Foundation, which is one of our, our leading uh, philanthropic organizations in the country, uh, honored Community Solutions by giving uh, by having them win a $100 million um, grant uh, called, from, called $100 million in Change, uh, which was a worldwide competition that um, highlighted Community Solutions as the uh, uh, national agency that deserves to get this kind of extraordinary funding to move us all towards ending homelessness for veterans and others. And I'll, I'll hand it over to you guys. Thanks so much. 
Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, that introduction. My name is Adam Riggie. I'm director for um, learning evaluation here at Community Solutions, and um, I'm actually very familiar with a lot of the work that's been done in uh, Los Angeles VA. I was a previous employee of the VA Homeless Program Office and uh, joined Community Solutions uh, back last May. So uh, we're going to talk about uh, quality binding lists, um, and I uh, want to turn over to Aras Yuzan, who will be uh, doing the the bulk of the presentation and also have we'll have a question and answer period at the end. So Ross, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Adam, and thanks everyone for the invitation to be with you. Uh, my name is Aras Chizan. I'm based in Los Angeles. So I'm, I'm very honored for the chance to get to speak to all of you and grateful for the work you're doing. Uh, so if we can go to the next slide. Um, I'll actually, before I jump in here, just give you a, a, a 10 second overview of what Community Solutions is and then the work that we do. I think um, really grateful for for the the great tee up from um, from Joshua. So uh, we're a national not for profit organization. We partner with cities and counties continuums of care uh, to shift the way that they approach the work of ending homelessness. The work that we do is not fee for service. We don't charge folks for technical assistance. Our goal and mission is to offer whatever support is valuable to local teams to shift the way they're doing the work. Uh, and so with that in mind, one of the approaches that I feel very passionately about and that our organization feels passionately about is this idea of a by name list or a shift in the way that communities, local teams use data to drive their work. Uh, in a nutshell, when we say by name list, what we mean is just a data source that represents everybody experiencing homelessness that's updated in real time with a bit of an asterisk. So as close to real time as possible, right? We sort of draw the line at at least monthly, that data is getting refreshed in a comprehensive way. So that if somebody asks how many veterans are currently experiencing homelessness in Los Angeles or in any community, the folks locally would have a pretty good idea of what that number is. Now you might ask why, that's a lot of effort. Why go through the effort of building that data source? What are you doing with it? Well, first I should say that that data is, is honoring client or veteran consent, um, but it's not just a name. Right, so we say by name list, but that's a bit of a, an understatement. It's really something that captures somebody's homeless history, health and housing needs. It both enables uh, folks, practitioners in the system to have the information necessary to work with that veteran or client or individual uh, to support them to resolve their housing crisis. I think it also enables uh, folks thinking about the system level to understand who is experiencing homelessness, who is our system serving well, and who are we not serving so well? And I think it takes a bit of information about those individuals or households to be able to ask and answer those questions. Uh, lastly, I should say here, uh, the word list sometimes is misleading to folks. They think list, all right, we're talking about a spreadsheet, we're talking about a bulleted list. Uh, I, I think thinking of this as a, a composite data source is the way to go. So what I've seen uh, in communities that are successful in taking this methodology or approach is that a by name list represents data from multiple systems. For example, in the case of veterans, it's likely to include data from homes and HMIS, uh, two different databases that different uh, entities locally are using to track care coordination and care provision. Um, but the goal is to get us a more complete picture and to ultimately improve care coordination so that the experience of the end users of these systems, of, of veterans experiencing housing crisis or homelessness or anybody experiencing housing crisis or homelessness is improved. So with that said, if you can go to the next slide. I started to allude to this already. Uh, so whenever I'm talking about a tool or a framework or approach, I could tell you all about what it is, uh, but I think we ought to start with what is it used for? And so with that in mind, uh, I think the four main beliefs that our team has about a by name list and how it might be used to drive an end to homelessness. First, to conduct case conferencing or to other care coordination efforts. Second, to track and communicate progress towards reducing and ending homelessness. So again, that aggregate accountability measure, right? So if we can't talk about how many people are experiencing homelessness, how many veterans are homeless today, how can we know if we're making progress towards the end goal? And I, I would assert that the end goal ought to be reducing and ending homelessness as defined by the, in, in part by the number of people experiencing homelessness at any given time. Third, uh, we want to understand who's experiencing homelessness in the community. And ideally, you're able to stratify or slice that data by different categories. 
race, ethnicity, age, gender, income, neighborhood. So when we talk about Los Angeles, we know that that region is not a monolith. And so I'd like to be able to look by spa or by zip code or by, you tell me, right? Local teams, different jurisdictions have different definitions of how they wanna be able to slice the data. But here are some ways that we've seen um, drive systems improvement and good conversations about equity, which I think are crucial. Lastly, uh, we wanna understand trends in system performance. And my sense is that um, y'all are, are highly familiar with some of the ways in which we might wanna set some goals related to system performance. Um, maybe my suggestion is, uh, in order to be able to track these things in a meaningful way, we might want to look beyond program and project data to think about system-wide data or some data source that tells us about every veteran experiencing homelessness in our community rather. Um, and I think in order to be able to do that, you need to be able to integrate multiple data streams to have that more complete picture. Okay, so that's a little bit about why we might do this or how we would use this tool if we had it. Um, now, if you go to the next slide, I'd love to tell you a bit about um, just a, an applied example of what this has looked like in our work. This is data about uh, the number of veterans who are homeless in a community. This is a, a community with you know, medium size, not quite on the scale of Los Angeles. Uh, but what you're looking at is data that they shared with my team month over month about how many veterans were homeless. And what I wanna draw your attention to is the circle here, <laughs> which drew a lot of attention and a lot of raised eyebrows from local leaders who perceived that this might represent a big crisis in terms of how many veterans were experiencing homelessness on any given day. And what I wanna tell you is that this is a story about data quality improvement. It's not a story about homelessness getting worse. In other words, in this community, for a long time, a number of service providers were not participating in data sharing. So when they were talking about how many veterans are experiencing homelessness, they had an imperfect picture of the pie. They were reporting out on two thirds of the pie. Then that other one third started to share data with the system, but because they couldn't account for they couldn't communicate clearly the improvement in data quality. They were unable to effectively communicate what was going on. And a lot of fire alarms went off for no reason. And it, it was a bit of a uh, distraction from the work. And so the reason I'm telling you about this is because one of the firm beliefs that our team has is that if you're going to take an approach predicated on using data for improvement, you need to be able to really center uh, a conversation about data quality. So how full is the picture of the data that we're talking about? And to be able to account for improvements in that data quality over time. Otherwise, you're left in a position like this one where um, the data may be misleading to folks because you may be improving data quality and it may look like homelessness is getting worse. So with that in mind, uh, if you go to the next slide, We've got some suggestions on an approach to take uh, to talk about the quality of a by name list or of this data. Um, so at a nutshell, and I won't go too far into detail here, we think that you should measure data quality by thinking about full coverage. So is the data comprehensive? Is everybody sharing that data in a meaningful way? Is the data person level? So do we have all the details that we need about the individuals experiencing homelessness in the community? Is it updated regularly and is it reliable? So those are four big questions we think you ought to be asking and to be tracking improvement across those four dimensions. And so uh, we've developed in conjunction with federal partners and stakeholders on the ground, sort of a checklist or a scorecard, a self-evaluation for teams to use to start to ask and answer some of these questions about coverage, person level data, regular updates and reliability. Um, I'm very happy to share that with you. I believe Eugene has the full text of that PDF. We certainly don't have time to go through it line by line today, but I just wanted to share it with all of you in case this ends up being a direction that the local team in Los Angeles is curious about or wants to pursue. I'd recommend that as an artifact that's helpful to get your bearings about what this approach takes, uh, what the playbook is for getting to successful quality by name list type data. If you go ahead and go to the next slide. Again, when we're talking about quality of a by name list, uh, our team uses two different indicators. The first one I just mentioned to you, that by name list 
scorecard, which we're, we'll happily share with you, and I, I think it can be instructive. The second one is obviously then just looking at the data itself and letting that tell you something about whether it passes the sniff test, so to speak. So a concrete example that we use all the time is a metric related to data reliability. Um, if you have a checking account with a bank and you deposit $100, you expect to see your balance increase by $100, right? Your, it balances out. Your checkbook, your dollars in, your dollars out correspond to your checking balance. In the same way, we could think about a homeless response system. Uh, so if you, your system is reporting that 100 veterans have moved into permanent housing, we should expect that those veterans should be deducted from the number of veterans who are experiencing homelessness in Los Angeles. And we would just look to see, are those numbers adding up over time? That often just tells you about participation, about data quality reporting habits. So again, not gonna belabor this, but just to say there are some ways that we think local teams can dig into whether the data quality is good so that you can start to use it to inform some of your decision-making. And so maybe if we go to the next slide, I'll just again say that that uh, attachment is there. So these are some of the elements associated with that scorecard, um, some policies and procedures, some data points around participation, some things around infrastructure. And if you go to the, the next slide, I wanna talk to you a little bit about, um, and, and so here's sort of what that artifact looks like. Uh, we've shared it as a PDF. Uh, so again, happy to, to answer questions about it, but also very happy to leave it with, with all of you uh, to sort of have as a reference point for what some of this methodology looks like. Thank you. And so if you go to the, uh, advance to the next slide for me, I'd love to just offer a case study about uh, a large city context. So some of the, what we hear from, from complex, large jurisdictions like Los Angeles, where we know the scope of the problem is pretty different or unique, is a question about viability. So how, is it really possible in Los Angeles to know every veteran experiencing homelessness by name? Is it possible? Well, I think that it, I think that it is, but I think that it takes uh, some real intention and work. And so I wanted to share some lessons learned from the Metro Denver region. And I'll acknowledge Denver is not as big as Los Angeles, but it is a pretty large jurisdiction that has some complexity, multiple counties, a lot of different stakeholders, a lot of geography, a lot of square miles. And so uh, I, I connected with some of the folks in Metro Denver and, and we pulled together this information for you. And um, if of interest, I'm sure that they would be willing and interested uh, to, to make some connections to across local teams, I think that, that it can be really fruitful. But I wanted to hold up uh, something that they identified as a key ingredient of their approach, which I know folks in Los Angeles are familiar with as well. Taking that large jurisdiction, Metro Denver, breaking it up into smaller sub-regions, localizing the problem and making sure that the system is reflecting the perspectives of stakeholders and that solution ownership becomes more precise, more attuned to local problems. Um, but then making sure that there's standardization across those different sub-regions within Denver. Uh, so their goal was to create a single veteran by name list across all of Denver. They had a sub-regional approach where they stood up nine sub-regions based on service provider and shelter of highest engagement. They identified that every veteran was going to be sort of associated with one of these sub-regions and they worked out a process by which folks would be uh, the data would be updated to reflect if individual homeless veterans moved across parts of the region right so so the ability to update what sub-region an individual was associated with the so sub-regions developed local homeless coordination teams with leads and staff and clear roles and responsibilities and each sub-region had a team uh, of sort of designated responsible for local data quality using this by name list scorecard and approach that we've told you a little bit about today. Um, and they were really the, the agents who were thinking about getting to comprehensive participation, adequate street outreach coverage, and so on. So rather than try and solve all of those big problems system-wide, they took a more granular approach splitting out into these nine sub-regions and they saw a lot of success with that approach. So my suggestion uh, might be that in a place like Los Angeles, if you wanted to take this by nameless approach for veterans, uh, a roadmap there would involve also thinking about 
sub-regionalization to take the big complex system and distill it down into more operationally meaningful jurisdictions. Okay, that's a lot of information for y'all. We tried to keep this pretty shallow for today by design. Very happy to follow up and go deeper on any areas where people have questions. Um, but grateful again for the opportunity to be in conversation with you and hopefully this felt like a useful place to start. Thank you so much, Aras. Um, before I ask some of the questions that I have, I was wondering if there any other um, BCOIB members who would like to ask any questions from our uh, friends at Community Solutions? All right, well, here's my, my question is around outreach and populating the by name list. Um, so Los Angeles is a very challenging place to do homeless care because it's so spread out, you know, going all the way from Antelope Valley down to Long Beach um, and relying on agencies who report into HMIS, for example, or shelters, other service delivery agencies to report in is a, a successful way of getting the by name list populated. But what have other communities around the country done to try to populate their by name list for people who don't necessarily come in contact with uh, agencies that could report in through HMIS? How, how, does the, how do you build an outreach system? And what are the components of a high fidelity outreach system that could make the true number of people who are on the by name list be a reflection of homeless veterans across this very large space? A great question, and particularly for places like Los Angeles and other communities with large unsheltered homeless populations. Outreach is critical for feeling like you have a comprehensive, meaningful data source. So in that scorecard, there are three questions we think the community needs to ask and answer about outreach. Is it documented? Is it coordinated? Is it sufficient? So what you're getting at is the sufficient question. Do we have enough outreach? How would we know if we had enough outreach? So very worthy question. But I think before we go there, do we know how much outreach we're doing today? And has it documented somewhere? So there are usually multiple different teams doing street outreach in a place as big as Los Angeles. Are those teams coordinating where they're going, when they're going, and sharing data with one another? That's where I would start. And if it is documented and coordinated, then we should start to talk about how would we know, what would give us confidence that the outreach was sufficient. And there are some models for thinking about that. One way to think about it is nobody should be street homeless for more than blank days before they're connected to the system. And you start to test that model, right? So you might draw a line at seven days or 14 days or whatever feels viable as a place to start. And then you start to collect that data and use that as a signal for whether you have sufficient outreach in your geography. So that's just one approach. I think um, what feels exciting here is that I'm not the expert. I don't do street outreach, but we have plenty of national experts around coordinated street outreach. Um, and should this be something that Los Angeles is interested in, I feel confident that we can find an analogous community in terms of uh, size, if not density, of no number of people experiencing homelessness that could talk to of folks here or anybody about the approaches they've taken for coordinated comprehensive street outreach. I think it is a, a, a set of big technical problems, but again, I think that there is a playbook here, a, a way to approach it, and to at least have a, a mechanism by which you, you ask and answer, do we have enough street outreach? And if not, I think there's an obvious answer there, which is invest in more dedicated street outreach capacity until you hit the point where you suspect you might be um, meeting the need or demand there. Great, thank Adam. you. Oh, sorry, Adam. Oh, no, I was just going to see if Adam had anything to add. No, I, I, I think that's spot on, Ross. And, uh, and Matt, I see you're still on camera. Um, any comments on that that you want to share at this time about what you're looking at in terms of outreach and quality and where you, where you feel things are? I think that's something we can always improve on. Uh, so we are working with our community partners and making sure that we uh, you know, leverage the outreach teams that are already in the community so that we have more staff uh, working to find veterans and letting us know when they do find them and getting them put on the current by name list that we have. But I, I was interested in your question that you had, uh, Dr. Bamberger, about the 
how do we get the information from uh, organizations that don't use HMIS? That was, a, I thought that was a, that's a struggle we have is that there are a number of organizations that have contact with veterans and, and have other than calling us up, you know, no way of really letting us know. Yeah, and I think that really, really goes to the issue of people exiting existing supported housing. I think, you know, that should be sort of a, 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 a forensic event, right? For me, having done supportive housing for these last 33 years, you know, we want to keep the number of people who end up cycling from permanent supportive housing to the street to the low single digits, more like one, two, three percent. Um, do you find in your by name list um, fidelity efforts that you highlight people falling into homelessness from housing in a specific category that is brought to the attention of your collaborators with the kind of a, um, energy that I think is really important? Absolutely. So I think. Um... A two part answer here. First, I think the ability to differentiate between returns from housing, returns from what we call inactive status, which is uh, a sort of locally determined designation, but usually corresponds to folks not having any engagements or enrollments within a set period of time. So 90 days, nobody has seen this individual, right? Um, they're not removed from the by name list. They've just had their status updated. Um, and lastly, folks who are currently actively uh, homeless or, or newly experiencing homelessness in the system. So in other words, being able to differentiate between returns and people who are new to the system is really crucial. Um, the question of data source, like how would we know, especially for folks who are not in HMIS, is a really, uh, one of those questions that I don't have a uh, elegant answer to, but I have a really concrete one which is uh, you bring together the stakeholders in the community and you inventory who would need to be sharing data with us, regardless of whether or not they're in HMIS, to be able to have a comprehensive by name list. You inventory them. You then add a column to that inventory that says, where is their data today? <laughs> is it in HMIS? Is it in another system? Are they not doing meaningful data collection and sharing? My hunch is that most agencies and organizations do have some data. It's just not data that's shared yet. And so if that's true, that presents an opportunity. Uh, it does present some technical challenges, but I have confidence that they're very uh, overcomable, if we want to use that language. But uh, again, the first step is just getting clearer on who are the participating agent ser agencies, service providers, whose data needs to get integrated. And then you sort of map out, okay, we've got data in four different silos today. That's what it would take is being able to look across these four different data sources Obviously, there are going to be considerations around privacy and um, security of how that data integration is happening. Uh, but I think those are manageable technical challenges once folks are on board with the idea and you've done that mapping. This is probably a stupid question, um, and I probably should know the answer. But when you compare by name list to point in time count, and you have a really high functioning by name list where you think it's close to being comprehensive. Does the by name list usually have more or less people in the point in time count? Adam, I know you've done some of these analyses. I don't know if you want to chime in here. Yeah, it, it is very, uh, quite variable depending on the community. Uh, we have seen instances where it's been um, uh, many more and instances where it's been many less. And I think that speaks to how the pick count is implemented differently in different communities. Um, so it, it is it is quite variable. I think we have seen in some of our communities, more evolved communities, that there is a, a close alignment. I'm thinking Aras, I, I think we looked at like Rockford, Illinois, for example, and there was there was some pretty close alignment. But for many other communities, it is it is quite variable. The other thing that I'll add, Adam, is I know uh, where there are gulfs. Sometimes folks attribute those to data quality on the point in time side. So we know that particularly for things like veteran status, a point in time is usually either uh, using some kind of blunt modeling. So we, you know, 
X percent of people may be veterans, or if there's a, a point, so I know in Los Angeles, for example, we're not talking to folks when we do a point in time here, right? So it's not as if people are self-reporting veteran status. So I, I, other folks would know better than I do how we're extrapolating uh, the number of vets, but I do know that in those instances where there's the extrapolation, it can be pretty variable. In the instances where we're asking folks to self-report, uh, so we're, we're getting out of the car and talking to the person experiencing homelessness during the point in time, trying to collect some information about them, I've seen that that is often uh, uh, often very closely aligned to the administrative data in a by name list. Uh, the gulf is bigger when it's we're projecting. Yeah, I guess my take home around these two numbers is that when you're looking at community trends, perhaps uh, looking at a point in time count, since you're comparing the same methodology every other year is a reasonable thing to do. But if you want to see the impact of investing in housing, for example, the 1500 units that we look forward to having on this you know, 388 acre parcel, the by name list is where you need to look. With, with, is, that, is that an accurate way of looking at those two things? That makes all the sense in the world to me. I think you can definitely get a lot of that value out of a by name list too, longitudinal analysis. But I think at minimum, if I want to know the impact of that parcel, I would like to know something about who moved into the units in that parcel. <laughs> and the point in time count isn't gonna be able to give you that line of sight into how long were those folks experiencing homelessness in our community? What's their demographic profile and so on. So I think being able to disaggregate the information uh, is, is really part of the value add here, the connective tissue between client level data and aggregate level data that I think the point in time is never gonna be able to give you. Great, thank you. Other questions from the group? All right, well, thank you again for taking time to come share with us your expertise in this area. Uh, and I'm really excited that what you have to offer and I look forward to, you know, as I think we all know, there are things you've learned that others, other agencies also have learned across the country. And I think those consulting groups are also deeply engaged in conversations with the SERS folks. And I look forward to hearing um, all of that coming out in reports of how we're making headway to bend this curve and mostly to uh, improve the lives of veterans who are living on the streets. So thank you so much for coming. Pleasure to be with you. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. very much, Community Solutions. We appreciate your time and uh, certainly a learning experience for me. Thanks. And certainly certainly give our thanks to Ms. Sandor as well, please. Certainly will. Um, and please, uh, I think you have our contact information. Don't hesitate to, to follow up with any questions or follow-ups. We'd be eager to be in conversation. Excellent. Thanks very much. Thank you. Okay, gang, it looks like we're down to uh, some of our internal discussions, but before we do that, <clears throat> let me just uh, ask uh, for those of you that, that have a lot more expertise in this and by name list and point in time counts. Um, could anybody just really summarize for the, for the, for LA? And I mean that in the broadest sense. Um, does a by name list uh, exist? And is there this um, sharing uh, of homeless information uh, out there? Yes, uh, that's, that's Matt McGarren. Yes, we have a by name list. We we did a, some of the strategies they did talk about. We do have it divided up by our service planning areas in LA County. And we also are developing the by name list for the outlying counties, the four other counties in our catchment area. Uh, the by name list we have now differs from the point in time count, but we are trying to reconcile that data uh, as we go along. We do, it is not the, I mean, so we are suspect that we have not, have not identified all the homeless veterans on the by name list. So it's a work in progress and we do have teams that meet on a regular basis to add or remove veterans when the, when they no longer need, where they are no longer homeless, or they, we do identify them as being newly homeless. And then we're also using that by name list now. One of our strategies is to uh, use that by name list as a kind of a matching system for our coordinated entry team to match it to resources that are available. General Hopper, from my perspective, I think the the by name list exists, and I think you know, seeing where it can sit within the scorecard that we just described in terms of quality 
would be an interesting exercise, not necessarily one that would be that useful, but I think that we all recognize that the outreach functions that are available across this incredibly large uh, geography is inadequate. Um, so just looking at the numbers and, and Matt, you can talk about this. You know, I hear you know, two, three outreach workers employed by the VA for spa, you know, take a spa. Um, that seems inadequate, but I don't know. But what I hope to do and what we're going to get to next with our recommendation is to, is to encourage the, the secretary to uh, create a outwardly facing dashboard so that we can track these kinds of things. Matt, are there things that you think you would like to, that you're specifically trying to improve upon that we can track to uh, support you in that effort? Uh, well, yeah, sure, there's a lot to improve on, but in the suggestions that you make, I think increasing outreach staff is is one thing. I don't think that that's a, a total solution because we do have community partners that do outreach also, so we could we could leverage those better. I think the, the uh, definition of roles between the community partners and us and who does what, even our own uh, supported services for veterans, families, grantees, um, we could partner better with them so that we're, they, they sometimes keep their own list uh, so that the services go through just their from their street outreach to their uh, rapid rehousing or into their even grant per diem programs because they're all in the same agency and it's easier for them. So we could do a lot better with that coordination, which is one of our goals for this coming year. Um, and I, you know, connecting with community solutions is, is probably a good strategy for us too to see what uh, how, what kind of recommendations they can make. General Hopper, this is Larry Vasquez. I have a question, if I may. Sure, Larry, go ahead. Yeah, so um, Matt, great points. Um, and certainly increasing your outreach staff is, is going to be great. But given the fact that we know the challenges of just timelines of getting you uh, folks on board, uh, it, it seems that your your strategy to use community partners, you could do that tomorrow in a very much shorter time frame. Um, <laughs> what, what and I'm just thinking for a spa, you have a a partner that is responsible for populating the by name list in that spa, let's say. Uh, but then it comes back to the question that was asked about sharing information, right? How do you get that into a into some sort of tool that allows everybody to have transparency and allows people to take action to help the people on that by name list? Yeah, so they, they have regular by name list meetings within each spa so that the data does get reconciled as much as it can uh, with our community partners and the VA staff. Sure, is that a electronic records that people can see? Because I thought that was a yeah. question that was asked. How, how does how does a um, one of your community partners, when they're collecting all this information, how do they bring it into a tool like HMIS or, or some other tool? Well, most of them do have access record. to HMIS, so we, can, we get the data from there. And that the ones that have access, we can look at it as the actual list from the system. Um, th that was the question I had is the what partners that don't have access to HMIS are not involved. I'm thinking things like food banks or, you know, uh, faith based organizations that are not always in our HMIS system. Um, sure. So th that so, is the gap, I think. So the way you set it up for every for each spa that you have, is there one organization, one community or even two that are responsible for helping you to populate that by name list? It's my coordinate entry specialists that do it. And how many of those? I, have? I have three. Three coordinate entry specialists that do the that work on the by name list. And they have they have spas and then there's there's um, by name list team meetings that they run. So the the data is already in HMIS. It just has to be presented as a by name list. So now they aren't doing outreach. Those coordinated entry specialists don't do the outreach. There's outreach staff that do outreach. Right. So you've got three people that coordinate um, the by name list in, was it five spots, six spots, five spots, right? Eight spots. Eight spots. Yeah. You find that that's efficient? They're, they're able to do that? Well, that's what we're working on. So I think it's sufficient to, to generate the list. The, 
whether the list is complete or not is the second is the real question. Okay, thanks. Heidi, I'm sorry to uh, focus on you, but anything you want to comment from LASA's standpoint about how things are going in terms of sharing uh, from LASA to VA around the by name list and things you're working on that we should know about and we can support? Yeah, I don't think anything other than what Matt has said. Um, you know, it's a work in progress in terms of data sharing, but I think we're definitely making some really great progress together. Um, the challenge with LA, as always, is the scale, um, particularly around by name lists in this model, um, because it is so large. But all that to say, I think we have all the right people in the room and we're building in the right um, controls and systems to make sure that we have the best version of the by name list that we can get. So. Um, it's better than it was than I, than I think it's ever been. Um, we still have work to do, but I think we'll get there. And I, I got to say, Heidi and her team have been really helpful. I mean, just a great, great partners with. Uh, I mean, in particular, she has one uh, person that works with us um, that's been in all of our meetings and and uh, really bothering us to do better. So I really appreciate that effort. Thank you. Okay, any other comments there? Okay, let's move on to the services subcommittee and uh, discussion of a uh, recommendation. Josh, over to you. Thank you. Um, so the services subcommittee this uh, cycle has one recommendation that we'd like to propose to the group for a vote um, as, as a dovetail to this exact discussion. Um, as I often say, you can't sew what you can't see, the surgical thought, right? And if you don't see the edges of the wound, you can't put them together. So the goal here uh, to try to support uh, VAGLA's efforts to reduce and end homelessness is to create a um, outwardly facing dashboard that is accessible in real time for anyone across the entire world to look at uh, to see how they're doing. And the way that we've had this discussion uh, in early iterations of this recommendation, yeah, I put in uh, all very specific, <laughs> overly specific details uh, on what I thought should be in this dashboard. And after a good support and discussion in our subcommittee, um, tried to keep the component that we're actually recommending to quite a general thing, but leading with um, the, uh, set up that talks about some more of the specific uh, aspects of this uh, issue that leads into the more general recommendations. Um, so as unfortunately the way this works, you get to have bedtime reading from, from me as I have to read this thing uh, for a vote. Um, so I'll get to that in a second. Um, but before I do that, and you know, we don't have to necessarily approve it is as written we can edit this as we go so if there are any things that we feel we really need to enter in to change we can try to do that and then vote on um, those recommendations as we go so um, that's my lead in for this i hope you've all had a chance to read it um, even though you're going to hear me read it again any comments questions from particularly from the master plan subcommittee who haven't been involved in the discussions as much Comments from the services subcommittee before we have bedtime reading. <laughs> I'll save it until after you're done reading, Josh. Okay, goody. Here we go. <laughs> Whereas permanent supportive housing is the evidence-based solution to ending homelessness for veterans experiencing chronic homelessness. Whereas in 2021, there was 24.4% reduction in permanent housing placements reported by the VA in Greater Los Angeles compared to fiscal year 2017. Whereas there continues to be many vacant staff positions in the HUD-VAS system of care in VAGLA. Whereas there are vacant project-based rental units across the Greater LA area that are set aside specifically for veterans experiencing chronic homelessness. Whereas reporting regular progress on filling project-based housing units and utilization of tenant-based HUD-VASH vouchers 
can be an effective measure to assess progress toward housing veterans experiencing homelessness. Whereas a by name list that reports on the number of veter veterans experiencing homelessness that exits from homelessness, the influx into homelessness, including from stable permanent supportive housing, and the time veterans remain homeless can be an effective can be effective in measuring progress and holding communities responsible for progress in reducing the number of veterans experiencing homelessness. Whereas the secretary of the VA has set the goal that by the end of 2022, placing quote at least 1,500 veterans experiencing homelessness into permanent housing unquote and quote and increasing the percentage of housing and urban development veteran affairs supportive housing vouchers under at least to at least 75% unquote. Now, therefore, let it be recommended the secretary of the VA instruct the leadership at the Greater Los Angeles Veterans Affairs Administration to create a web based dashboard available to the general public that reports on progress in providing permanent housing for veterans experiencing homelessness in the, homelessness in the greater LA area. The dashboard should include at least the following metrics. One, monthly report of available HUD VASH vouchers and utilization for both tenant based and project based housing, and two, quarterly reporting on progress toward filling vacant HUD VASH staff positions, and three, monthly reporting on by name list that is in coordination with the LA Homeless Services Agency and maintains industry standards for by name list fidelity, and four, monthly progress on available housing at the West LA VA campus, and finally five, quarterly reporting on progress toward placement of veterans in residential care facilities, board and care, and assisted living level of care. In witness thereof, the Veterans and Community Oversight and Engagement Board adopts this recommendation as of March 31st, 2022. <sighs> Hate that part. Questions, comments? Yeah, we, we talked a little bit via email from earlier, Josh, about this, but uh, yeah, I really, you know, we, as we've been talking about utiliz underutilization a lot, which is great, which is a big part of it. So we, you know, we need to turn the sink on a little bit higher as far as utilizing this va these VASH vouchers. But the part is, is if we're not t keeping an eye on those that are falling out of housing uh, under, um, you know, uh, conditions that uh, we want to avoid like not getting treatment or uh, not following rules, things like that. Um, you know, those veterans create a lot of wreckage in their life. And I think it needs to be part of the, the dashboard so that not only we're seeing, uh, you know, the veterans that are, that are coming in and utilizing the vouchers, but also, you know, how are we doing, not just as a VA, but as a community, keeping those veterans in their housing and not creating additional wreckage like evictions and financial wreckage. Um, so I think it's a very important metric that we consider and, and uh, thanks for all the back and forth and dealing with my, uh, my stuff, Josh, I appreciate you. Um, I get wound up about this because I was in a GPD program myself about 12 years ago. So 12, 13 years ago. And so this is personal. Uh, I also want to mention that I, I like all the, uh, the work on those that are homeless, uh, chronically homeless, but we as a board, hopefully will take a look at how are we uh, working with those that are transitioning out of the military to prevent homelessness in the beginning. Uh, you know, we lost the uh, GPD that was focused on that, did a lot of good work around uh, transitioning veterans. And uh, with 388 acres, I think we've got a big opportunity to, to repurpose some of our effort to uh, look at those that are transitioning out. That's it on my end. Thanks. So um, for those of you who weren't privy to the back and forth that Jim and I had, one of the things he was suggesting was specifically putting into the recommended section something that highlights uh, reporting of veterans who leave supported housing and cycle back to homelessness. And um, I tried to incorporate that into the description of what I thought was a high fidelity by name list. And one of the things that we've talked about a lot in, in the VCOAB is not creating too much of a specificity so that we sort of tie the hands of the secretary to uh, concur with our recommendations, because if we uh, create too much specificity, then uh, we'll get the dreaded concur in principle. Um, and with concur in principle, we often aren't able then to make headway. So I'm fearful that if we put in, Jim, the specificity about reporting uh, on the dashboard exits from 
uh, project-based or other hud vast units, then it's possible that the VAGLA won't be able to get that information in a timely manner because it's all dependent on the reporting that's coming into them. So they'll feel unable to um, stand up this entire recommendation because it's, the specificity on information coming into them is limited. So I, my preference, and again, I, I'm open to what the group has to say, but my preference is to leave it as the generalities that it is, recognizing that a, the fidelity of a by name list requires that it incorporates exits from housing. But I'm op open to what you think, and we can put in another another recommended line if if the group decides. Yeah, I mean, my, my feedback on that, Josh, just hearing from Heidi and, and Matt, I mean, it sounds like there's a lot of collaboration between LASA and the VA at this point. And, um, you know, the LASA's close relationship with the uh, housing authorities, uh, it just doesn't seem like it would be a big issue considering that high level of collaboration to get that data from the housing authorities, because I understand it doesn't exist uh, within VHA. Um, but, I mean, I think we, we need to leverage the collaboration we have between the two agencies to... Uh, to uh, include that because it's extremely important uh, considering the amount of wreckage that can be created by dropping out of housing. Uh, and I'll, I'll, uh, I'll stop there and won't offer any more input. Josh, can you hear me? Testing my mic. Yep. yep. Hallelujah. Okay, hi everybody. We get to see you now, Dr. Harris. <laughs> um, the only piece I wanted to add to this one is just that the, this question of the nature of exits out of permanent supportive housing, out of HUD-VASH in particular, is of considerable interest to us too. So wh whether it ended up formally being laid out here or not, this is something we're pursuing. Jim is right that our home's data doesn't capture the nature of the exit. It only captures the nature of an exit from case management and ideally, these kind of move outs, moves back in, people are staying in case management. So they really are invisible to us with our data. But if the housing authorities have that, that's something we're gonna be pursuing either way. So I just I share that primarily as a means of um, assurance to you all. And I also agree that it's a pretty critical piece of, a, of an active and accurate by name list is seeing that that kind of moves in and out of housing. All right, that certainly is a, a strong support of adding in another line that specifically adds to the recommendation of, ca of capturing exits from supported housing. Um, other comments? So General Hopper, what I would ask of the group is that you give me a few minutes to rewrite this <laughs> and then I'll send it back to you and then we'll vote on it before we close. Does that sound reasonable? Yeah, Josh, it, it it sounds reasonable, but I'm wondering, do you really even need a few minutes to <laughs> rewrite? Uh, can we not? Uh, uh, it, I mean, we, normally when you try to rewrite in the in the group of twenty five here, it it uh, it looks exactly like like what you expect. So well, you, I think if I have five minutes and you go on to the master plan subcommittee. I can circle back and just have that one one sentence added in, and then we can vote on okay. it. All right, you do that, and uh, we'll uh, go to the master plan subcommittee. Rob, good afternoon, everyone. You know, Josh, I think nineteen times out of twenty, that solution would work, but the master plan subcommittee doesn't actually have an agenda item today. <laughs> um, Thanks, there, buddy. Uh, yeah, I, you know, for people who worry that I love to hear myself talk, today will be one of those days that you'll remember, which is we really don't have much we're going to talk about as a committee. We're waiting to see how the secretary uh, issues the revised master plan uh, before we come up with any recommendations. So I, I've got to punt it back, General. Okay, Rob, people are going to start wondering what the hell kind of lawyer you are. You don't want to talk, but... Uh... But we'll take the time. Uh, just a few things as uh, as we do give Josh a, a few minutes to put together to alter uh, recommendation sixteen zero one. Uh, I forgot to give uh, apologies for Philip. He was uh, traveling and unable to join the the uh, call today. Uh, 
but we will uh, back brief him on. Of course, we've got the recording uh, for him to see and listen to. <clears throat> Uh, also, um, uh, as we get ready for this uh, in person meeting in June, uh, there's going to be. We want to take every opportunity we can to get people out and about. We we have people on the board now that have uh, never visited the campus. So it's really imperative. Uh, I think that we we build in some time to uh, to walk the battlefield a bit and uh, see what's out there and, and what the progress has been. See what it's like. And uh, and for everybody to get a good feel of that, so we'll make sure we uh, we lay that out actually fairly carefully. Probably give you a little bit of homework to do, and just thinking about uh, and visualizing and looking at uh, some of the graphics of uh, what you're going to see, and uh, to help uh, facilitate discussions both in June and uh, and going forward. Um, as far are you back, Josh? Yeah, it's like stretch. It's <laughs> just like you know. If you're, uh, yeah, if you're, I was going on and on. Uh, it's very simple. I, I'm ready. So whenever you guys. Are. Okay. Okay. I'll just finish up uh, my thought here, <laughs> uh, which of course now I've uh, forgotten what it was. Uh, yeah. So over to you, Josh. <laughs> okay. So just adding a six onto the bottom there. Uh, I'm just going to read it and we can vote on it. I'm not going to be able to send it to Eugene to post uh, in a timely manner, but simply six monthly reporting on the number of veterans exiting permanent housing. Period. Easy. Okay. Or, yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. So I need uh, I need a motion uh, on this. Sarah uh, Who was that? Sarah Serrano moved to vote. Moves to approve. And second for Mark Wellish. Yes, to approve. Yes, thank you. Gotcha, Sarah. And I got a second from Mark. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 <clears throat> Opposed? And hearing no nays, the motion uh, is approved. This recommendation will go forward to the secretary. Eugene, uh, did I mess you up there? Do you need a by name on that? No, sir. Uh, like I said, it would be a, a audible yay or nay, but uh, you, you okay. did fine. This way we've done it in the past. We're fine with that, sir. Okay, very good. Thanks. Uh, what do we have left here? Okay, I think we're probably at the cleanup phase. Uh, let me just uh, start by. Uh, uh, Going around the room uh, for members of the board, uh, anything uh, that you want to lay out on the table here before we close the doors today. Yeah, uh, General Hopper, Jim Purley. Um, hey, Jeff. Really good news about the funding, but I'm <clears throat> still having trouble reconciling the fact that it looks like everything is funded, and, we, and when we toured the Cabrillo site, uh, we were told there's 88 million dollar shortfall. And they're talking about fundraising and uh, naming rights within buildings and, and possibly going to Congress to pass a, a, a law allowing naming rights on site. So um, it's a little bit confusing to me. Yeah, Jim, I, I tend to agree with you. I, I wasn't with you at uh, Cabrillo, but. Um, that's always been a concern of mine is that, first of all, I, I just don't quite understand their, their budgeting and funding process, but <clears throat> it should be fairly simple. Uh, but at any rate, uh, matching it up with what's going on with the principal developer, uh, toward that end, we do have, or we will have the principal developer on the agenda for our uh, June meeting. And, um. Uh, and we will uh, be asking about the funding uh, and shortfalls and what needs to be done, if anything, to, to fix those. So uh, we'll hopefully cover that base, but it's getting pretty late. It, it, by the way, I don't know what VA's fiscal year is. Are they uh, in the fiscal year uh, 30 September? 
General Hopper, this is Steve Braverman. Yes, 30 September is our end of the fiscal year. October 1st is the new one. And okay. one, one thing that might just help clarify a little bit, the money that we're talking about in terms of funding is the money that uh, the, for the projects that VA is responsible for. And that should be different from what the principal developer is responsible for. Over. Yeah, I, I do understand that, Steve. Thanks for the clarification though. And uh, so that's why I think it's important now to get uh, get some input from the from the PD. Um, okay, well, did did we talk to your uh, comment there, Jim? Uh, yes, General Hopper, that's great. That's that makes sense. Um, you know, the really good news from the VA, but still, I mean, there's, this is a big dollar project, and the infrastructure is. is uh, is an issue after the first three buildings are uh, are uh, come online, as you know. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. General, this is uh, Anthony. Just to sort of talk about that issue because it, it's something that I've brought up repeatedly regarding you know funding for what utilities, and I think based off of this presentation, uh, the information provided to us is that that shortfall has has been. Met. I mean, uh, Dr. Braverman, may, maybe correct me if I'm wrong, but as far as VA's responsibility to fund what utility projects on site, it, it looks like that that need has been covered now. Yeah, I, I think two years ago when we were talking about a potential $100 million shortfall, $80 million shortfall that was associated with all the infrastructure requirements, uh, I believe we're well on the way to meeting all of that. Um, uh, with the caveat that we can only speak to a year or two ahead at a time because circumstances change, but there's a there's a commitment to get it all done. Over. So just for my own clarification, as far as the beyond the water pressure boosting system, the short term solution, the longer term solution for what utilities is funded. Is that right? Yes. 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 For that, that is that was part of that uh, forty million dollar and twenty million dollar package for the last two years. That's great news. Congratulations. Thank you. Okay. Other comments. Okay. Hey, hearing none. Uh, Mr. Bursler, anything for the good of the group? So I think he had to step off. At the drop. Okay, very good. Dr. Harris, anything more for this August body? It is indeed an August body and uh, appreciate the thoughtful feedback. Appreciate really the content throughout the meeting and um, your ongoing contributions. I remain really excited and optimistic about what we can all do and how impactful we can all be here. So thank you very much. Absolutely. Dr. Braverman. Uh, nothing additional. Thank you very much for the opportunity to present this this afternoon. Okay, thanks for hanging with us so uh, long, Dr. Braverman. I know you've got plenty of things to do, but we appreciate you uh, being here for this whole time. Uh, okay, well let's uh, let's wrap it up. Let's everybody get ready for uh, for June, and hopefully it will all come true. That COVID, whatever variation is out there, will um, will uh, not hold. Uh, not hold us back. I'm going to go out sometime here in the next couple of days and get my, I don't know how many, fourth. If it's the second booster, it's my fourth shot, I think, right? Is that right? Yeah. I don't know. I, I'm going to get the, the other booster they just approved for old people. Uh, sir, one other thing. Sorry? Just one other thing, sir. Okay. Oh, I'm not finished yet. Do you oh, follow? I'm sorry, sir. Hold on. Um, but uh, we can look forward to that. Uh, I look forward to the chance to, uh, in fact, meet in person uh, many of you that uh, I haven't had a chance to do that with before. Uh, so without further ado, DFO, it's your turn now. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Sorry about that. Sir, I'm not sure if this is Mac's last meeting or not, but I, I certainly want to publicly ah. thank him for, you know, all the support he's given us on all of the interactions with the BCOEB, whether it's a full committee meeting, the uh, information exchange or just uh, 
just lending his expertise and wisdom to the entire organization. I just wanted myself personally say thank you. Well, I, I will jump on that uh, DFO and uh, do that for the entire board. Uh, we will miss you, Mac. I, I don't know where we'll find another punching bag, but uh, but we will wish you the very best there. And <laughs> Dr. Braverman volunteers will wish you the very best uh, out there in Albuquerque. And when you're at the hot air balloon meets uh, out there, uh, think about us uh, working away here in, in uh, L.A. Thanks much, sir. Appreciate the opportunity. Okay, uh, DFO. So that's all I have. Okay, very good. Thanks, folks. Have a good evening. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.